and model in the country. Colorado election workers, election officials will not be intimidated. It's our job to protect democracy, and that's exactly what we're going to do. And good evening, and thank you for joining us for this special Denver 7 election coverage at 7 o'clock. Polls have now officially closed. Good evening, I'm Ann Trujillo. And I'm Shannon Ogden. We're very glad you're with us tonight. As Ann said, polls just closed in Colorado. That does not mean, though, the lines have disappeared. We want to give you a live look outside the voting center at the Emily Griffith Technical College. This is here in Denver, right off of Lincoln and 19th. People patiently waiting in line. At one point, we were seeing wait times of more than an hour with people trying to cast those last minute ballots. And now we have a live look at some of those wait times across Denver. Uh, we've seen Union Station, North High School. Uh, those have had some of the longest wait times, now about half an hour. And we should start to get our first uh, batch of state results just any minute. So stay with us. Uh, when that happens, we will bring those results to you live immediately right here. Okay, so for now, we are going to begin tonight our team coverage all across Colorado, including reporters at Democratic and Republican watch parties, also election analysts live right here in the studio with us. So let's first go to Denver 7's Jacqueline Allen, who's live at the Denver election headquarters. Jacqueline, polls closed, right. so the first numbers should start <laughs> coming in. They are coming in. In fact, they just released them just now. And you can just feel that sort of sense of excitement that things are going really well right now. Now, you saw those lines earlier. That was this last minute crush of voters. As long as they were in line before seven, they get to vote. I'm joined now here by Denver's clerk and recorder, Paul Lopez. Paul, we know that there was at one point a line of over an hour at yeah. the Emily Griffith, Griffith Technical College. Yeah. What was going on there? A lot of last minute voters uh, decided the last day to be able to vote, and they did. So they showed up. Um, we sent our squad out there, our staff. They were able to redirect traffic, send them to vote centers that had no lines. That is great news. And, we, and you can see behind us right now, we have some election judges there going through ballots, getting them ready to go into the scanners. Uh, we've heard about threats against workers, yep. against election officials. Yep. What has your office done to prepare for I that? Mean, it's really unfortunate. That's the time that we live in, but we prepare for it. They're always trained. They're trained throughout their, uh, throughout their process. These are veteran uh, poll workers, so they're doing a great job. And just as we were starting this newscast, we saw an alert that the uh, official results are just now starting yeah. to come in. Yeah. You guys, uh, 7 o'clock, boom, we start to see some results. 7 o'clock, 8.30, uh, I think 10 o'clock, and then 11.30 will be our last one for tonight, and then we'll continue counting throughout the week. All right, look forward to seeing what happens. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. I know you've got a busy night tonight. You said this is like your Christmas. Yeah, this is uh, Fourth of July, Christmas, and <laughs> almost Thanksgiving because there's been a lot of snacks around here. So <laughs> that, yeah. that is true. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, that you. was Denver Clerk and Recorder Paul Lopez telling us what's going on here, and he says he thinks they will have every ballot in their custody in Denver scanned by midnight tonight. And that is good news. Reporting live at Denver's election headquarters, Jacqueline Allen, Denver Seven. Yes, but you're not supposed to work on Christmas night usually. That's part of the <laughs> That's problem a good there. Point. <laughs> All right, here to break down really one of the most watched congressional races, certainly in Colorado, and even in the country, our Denver 7 political reporter, Megan Lopez. And Megan Yadira Caraveo and Barbara Kirkmeyer, they're chasing history tonight, hoping to become the first representative for the 8th Congressional District. So uh, are you seeing any results just yet? Not so far in the Colorado Secretary of State's website, which is what you see pulled up behind me. This is what we're going to see start populating here in just a bit. So all 435 House districts are up for re-election or election this year. Now, I want to talk about the 8th in particular because it is Colorado's newest congressional district. That means it's never been represented before. So it's a very big deal. A lot of national attention focusing on this district. What it's going to cover is Adams, Weld, and Larimer counties. I could show you those right here on this map. They're here in in the gray. So again, still waiting for those results to come in, but you could see exactly the area we're talking about. Now, this district's makeup is very interesting. We're talking about a, a, a majority of the district and the largest majority really in all of Colorado in terms of congressional districts being Hispanic and Latino voters. 39% of the district is made up of Hispanic and Latino voters. Non-white residents make up 52% of that district. So they will have a large say if they turn out out to vote. Now, both candidates are focusing on that Latino vote because it's making up so much of the population. Uh, really, we're starting to see uh, some of the updates you're going to see that's popping up on the Secretary of State's website. Um, but the reason they're focusing on the Latino vote is because of how much emphasis uh, these voters can really have and their needs. Republicans opened up a Hispanic community center in Thornton. Democrats have been leaning on Yadira Caraveo's background. Her parents are from Mexico. Now, let's talk about voter Democrats 
demographics just a little bit. 46% of this district is unaffiliated. That's pretty much in line with Colorado. 24% of the district is made up of Republicans. 27% of the district is made up of Democrats. And if that seems pretty even, that was the intention of that independent redistricting commission that had redrawn the district lines for the first time. Now, the district does have fewer registered voters than any other district in the state, which is interesting. Uh, so we'll have to see if their efforts really over the past several months, all of that advertising, all of that door knocking actually does anything to go ahead and, and to really get people uh, to turn out and vote or turn in their ballots. Now, let's talk a little bit about Yadira Caraveo. She is a pediatrician. She's a state representative representing House District 31 currently, first elected in 2018. As I said, her parents are from Mexico. If she's elected, she'd be Colorado's first Latina member of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, which is something that is she's running on in particular. In the legislature, she's really focused on health care issues in particular uh, because she is a pediatrician, because she is a doctor. So she's helped try to uh, sponsor bills to uh, lower prescription drug costs, for instance, to cut down on pollution, uh, to increase nicotine taxes and more. I want to go ahead now and switch to Barb Kirkmeyer. She is a state state senator, first term member of the Senate, and she was first elected in 2020. Now, before that, she does have a really long political experience. That's because she was serving as the Weld County Commissioner from 1993 to 2000 and then 2009 to 2020. Now, she was one of the people, interestingly, that wanted Weld County and 10 others um, in northern Colorado to actually secede from the state and to form a new state. That's something that even more recently she has kind of stood by. But she is a fourth generation dairy farmer. So she says she knows rural issues much better than her a Democratic opponent. Now, in her first term in the state Senate, she's passed bills uh, funding special education, for instance. She's put a lot of her emphasis on oil and gas, helping pass an oil and gas property tax reduction. She's helped restructure uh, government and with government organization bills. Um, and her focus is really, if she makes it into Congress, would be reducing inflation and deficits, curbing government spending, supporting an abortion ban after 15 weeks, um, and prohibiting you know, federal funding of abortion, immigration reform, a whole bunch of other things. Um, in recent weeks, she has been criticized for an ad that ran, um, and she did scrub her abortion stance from her website more recently, but she has seen a major national boost from Republicans on a federal level. National Republican, uh, the National Republican Congressional Committee bought $2.6 million in television ads in that district, and 538 is forecasting that Barb Kirkmeyer is clearly favored to win. In their simulations that they ran, she won 91 out of 100 times. So this is a district that is really interesting, that is going to be really historic no matter who wins because it's the first time that we're going to have this district. So it's really going to be kind of key to seeing how it sets up, you know, the next several years in the legislature, or I'm sorry, in, the, in Congress, and really what kind of goes on you know with this district and how it's represented really right. in congress but we're going to be keeping an eye on it for you and absolutely and no numbers in that in that race just yet but there are other numbers coming in so let's now go to tony kovaleski with more on that and we are waiting in for numbers to populate but first off hoping everybody voted or is any at least in line to vote your voice your vote no joke tonight we're going to watch a lot of the key races in the state and specifically take you behind the curtain into the different counties you can see up here the early numbers are now in and it just populated jared polis with a 79 to 19 percent with uh, a very small number coming in but what we're going to watch in this race and other races we're going to be able to look at the historic numbers and if you go back to 2018 when when governor polis was running against walker stapleton at the end he ended up with 53 percent of the vote right now we come to 2022 those early numbers that we just saw populate he's got an early lead of 78 percent now also going to those numbers the republican roadmap the democratic roadmap for winning as a democrat governor Polis is going to want to do really well in Boulder and Denver counties. Those are critical spots to build a 70, 75 percent of that vote lead. Also, he's going to be watching closely to see how he does in Jefferson County and Arapahoe County. Those are key counties. The other side of that coin for Republicans, Heidi Ganahl and, and the other Republicans on that list, they are going to be looking close at Douglas County, seeing a lot here, and El Paso County. They must fare extremely well in those counties and then try to break even in Jefferson County or in Arapahoe. 
Arapahoe County. So that's the statewide breakdown. Now when we get into those House seats, and, and you just heard Megan talk about the 8th, there's seven other House races that we're going to be looking at there. And in those races, as we get into them, it's basically a breakdown right now where Dems are expected to win one, two, and six. Seven, they're likely to win. So that gives Dems four seats in Colorado if it finishes as expected. And then on the Republican side, three, four, and five are expected to be easy victories for the Republicans. That eighth seat that Megan talked about, that's the one we're going to be watching all night long. And if Republicans win that, it's a 4-4 split. If Dems win that seat, it's going to be a 5-3 Colorado House to Washington, D.C. So a lot to watch tonight, and we're going to be continuing to crunch those numbers and see what's happening. You saw the numbers there for Governor. We're going to quickly click over to the AG race and see if those numbers have populated yet. They have not. So we will give you an update on those as the night goes on. It's going to be interesting. Stay with us. All right, we're going to have a lot of fun. Tony, Tony, glad you're here with us tonight. Uh, the first batch of numbers just starting to get in here. Um, again, very, very early in the evening right now. Senator Bennett uh, trying to seek uh, another term up against uh, political newcomers challenger Republican Joe O'Day right now. But again, I think this is uh, just 1% of the uh, precincts reporting right now. Yeah, numbers still very preliminary. And again, we mentioned District 8. They race to watch and still no numbers to report. Uh, it looks like the numbers that are at the Secretary of State's office right now, primarily Denver. So that's why that would explain why we don't have any numbers there for District 8. All right. And so this is uh, in uh, House District 7 right now uh, for Congress, Brittany Patterson. Uh, Eric Odlin in uh, in the race. Uh, this is um, again. This is this is so so very early uh, right now, and we'll we'll keep an eye on on all of these. So we're just now getting this very first trickle here. And in the third congressional district, same situation where we don't have any numbers in yet. So please bear with us. Uh, it's only 7:12 and. Ballots are just now being counted and tabulated, so we are waiting for these numbers, and we will bring them to you as soon as we get more. All right, and this is also I really my first election. I'm relying solely on my readers tonight, so this is a big, <laughs> uh, big, big night. Well, Jennifer, welcome Kovl to the club. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Kovaleski live at the Democratic Watch Party tonight. This is at the. Uh, Art Hotel, just over here on South Broadway. And Jen, I imagine there's uh, some strong optimism out there tonight. And in Shannon, just like you said, people are starting to show up and you can really feel the excitement as everything is pointing to it is going to be a very good night for Colorado Democrats. I'm joined now with State Senator Julie Gonzalez. First, I want to kind of start with we have heard about the long lines to vote in Denver in your district, your message to voters tonight who are still waiting to cast their vote. Absolutely. I am so proud of every Coloradan who has cast a ballot in this important election. If you are still in line right now uh, to vote, stay in line because your vote will count as long as you got in line before the polls closed at 7 p.m. We heard uh, about uh, lots of folks who are uh, heading to the polls at Emily Griffith at, at North High School, um, Tivoli Student Center at the Auraria campus, Union Station, right? We did see lots of folks turn up uh, and turn out, and I'm really looking forward to a great result um, to see Yadira Caraveo become the first Latina congressman uh, from Colorado. 
Senator, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. We will send it back to you guys in the studio. All right, Jen, thank you. So let's now go to Denver 7's Colette Bordelon. She is at Republicans' watch party in the Tech Center. So doors just open there, uh, Colette, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Republican firepower is getting ready to show up. I've already seen Republican candidate for governor Heidi Ganahl here. I've spoken with Eric Odland, who's running for that 7th Congressional District. And as those results are just starting to come in, obviously unofficial right now, it does show Jared Polis with a lead over Ganahl. It shows Griswold with a lead over Anderson. But Anderson, so that's the Secretary of State race, Anderson is considered to be someone who could capitalize on those split ticket voters. So still waiting to see, of course, as more of these results start coming in. This is a very small percentage of all of the ballots that have been cast in Colorado. When I was speaking with Eric Odland, that candidate for 7th Congressional, Congressional District, District, he was confident that he is going to pull out a win tonight. Right now, those polls are showing his uh, challenger, Brittany Pedersen, with a lead over him at the moment. But like I said, these results slowly starting to pour in. It's one of the most exciting parts about election night, I think, is just sitting here and refreshing and watching as those ballots get counted. All right, Colette, thank you for that. We will have plenty more for you tonight as more election results come in. Denver 7 is your Colorado election headquarters. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this short break. And welcome back to our election night coverage. We're just getting started, everybody. We have Republican strategist Laura Carno with us and Democratic strategist Steve Walcher. Welcome to you both. Thank you for your time tonight. Laura, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, you you're optimistic about the evening. Yes, it's, a, it's a, probably going to be a great night for Republicans. How, how good a night is the question? Um, there has been a lot of new information in polling over the last week about uh, uh, women in suburbs that are moving um, to to vote for Republicans, which is a huge change, uh, especially for these statewide races. Um, that's that's what it's all about is the suburban women. Um, I'm also looking for people on the initiatives voting uh, with their wallets. Um, 
Prop 121, which is the income tax rate reduction from Independence Institute. Um, people are broke, and I think they're going to vote with their wallets um, on a lot of these initiatives. Well, you have made that the central issue of this campaign. Yep. And Steve, how about you? Well, I'm looking nationally for the, uh, the U.S. Senate race in New Hampshire. If that's a close race at all, I think that's a tough night for Democrats nationally. Also, a couple of congressional races in Virginia, which I think will be very close and will be in play. If those are in play, then we have to look at that statewide or nationwide as it kind of moves our way. Uh, in Colorado, I think the top of the ticket looks pretty secure for Democrats, quite frankly, Michael Bennett and, and uh, Jared Polis. But down ticket, I think, is going to be a trickier combination. I think Pam Anderson's run a very good race for Secretary of State, for example. That could be a tough competition. So we'll have to see how it plays out. Yeah, we have the unaffiliated here that anything goes, that's right? That's right, absolutely. Right, and yeah. they are the majority. That's the, been a big trend in Colorado. And where are they going to land? Are those suburban women um, in that unaffiliated category? Are they voting for their children's schools? Are they voting with their wallets? All right. One of the things Laura and I talked about before we sat down was the turnout tonight. It's really been a pretty low turnout, which does not bode well for Democrats, by the way. It's considerably below the 2018 turnout number All right. right now. We're going to put a pin in right there. Uh, Steve and Laura here with us all night. Thank you again, and uh, much more to come. Stay right there. Thank you for watching this Denver 7 News election night update. I'm Andrew Hill. And I'm Shannon Ogden. The polls are closed now in Colorado, and the first batch of results are just starting to come in. Let's begin with the race for governor. Jared Polis seeking uh, a second term, and right now he is uh, beating a, a challenger Republican, Heidi Ganahl. Let's go on to the U.S. Senate race now. We understand we have some numbers where Senate, Senator Michael Bennett is seeking re-election as well and running up a tough race against uh, Joe O'Day. Bennett right now with 59% to O'Day's 39%.
All right, House District 8, this is sort of the, uh, the star of the, the evening here. Our brand new House District, just north of Denver right now. Uh, Barbara Kirkmeyer, the Republican here, is leading uh, Yadira Caraveo, state representative, the 57, 39%. So much money, so much attention in that race tonight. And now to the 7th Congressional District. This is Ed Perlmutter's seat. Brittany Pedersen with the lead right now at 61% to Eric Odlin's 38%. All right, let's go to House District 3. This is out on the West Slope. Uh, Lauren Bober, Adam Frisch right now, of course, uh, one of the, uh, the real political stars in the, uh, the conservative movement right now. We don't have any polls of that. Let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and skip through this. In fact, let's now go to uh, Colette Bordelon, who's at the Republican Watch Party in the Tech Center. Yeah, guys, we've been seeing those candidates start to come so far. I've seen Heidi Ganahl is here, Eric Odland. I had the chance to chat with him. I also have seen Lang Sias here and Joe O'Day also in the building. So everyone getting ready. That party starting in just four minutes officially. Like you guys said, obviously incumbent Governor Jared Polis has the lead right now over Republican challenger Heidi Ganahl. But even since those initial results started coming in, Ganahl is slowly creeping in, making that race a little bit tighter, still by around 200,000 votes of a difference. But like you guys were saying, this is still such a small amount of ballots that have been counted in these initial results. Also, like you guys pointed out, that race for United States Congress District 8 between Yadira Caraveo and Barbara Kirkmeyer right now, Kirkmeyer showing that lead. We are expecting her to be here tonight, hoping to chat with her. I know a lot of her Republican colleagues are hoping that she is celebrating a lead tonight, even though it's expected to be a tight race. All right, Colette Bordelon with the Republicans tonight. Thank you very much. Our political reporter, Megan Lopez, keeping an eye on the Colorado's key races as the uh, results start to trickle in. Megan? Hey there, Shannon. Yeah, we're taking a closer look at some of those results that are trickling in on the Secretary of State's website. Here I've got pulled up because we're finally starting to see some of those results, as you guys alluded to. The 8th Congressional District, by far the one that uh, has national attention here because it's Colorado's newest congressional district. Now, early results are certainly leaning toward Barb Kirkmeyer. She's this red line right here. She's up by about 9 votes at the moment. I want to show you why, though. And that Take a look at this map right here on the Secretary of State's website. Weld is the one that's reporting right now. What we saw in some of those early returns was obviously lower voter turnout than what we saw in 2018. But what we also saw was Democrats reporting in higher numbers, returning their ballots early in higher numbers than Republicans overall. And we also saw unaffiliated voters by and large returning their ballots in higher numbers. What we're going to want to pay attention to here in this district is really uh, the Latino vote. Also in those early returns, something that I was paying attention to is we saw a lot of women returning their, their ballots in higher numbers. Women 55 to 74 returned their ballots in the highest numbers early. Uh, but again, we saw, you know, some of those long lines uh, in Denver and in other areas. Uh, and we had heard that some Republicans were holding on to their ballots for a little bit longer. So this is a race we're going to be watching. All, All right, right, Megan, thank, thank you man. for that. We've also have news to break right now because ABC News has already called our governor's race for Jared Polis. Um, in fact, when I was just looking at the uh, the numbers from the Secretary of State's office, 59% to Heidi Ganahl's 38%. All right, so Governor Polis making quick work of this election uh, night and will serve a second term. Uh, we've got a big night still ahead, so I'm glad you're with us and keep it here all evening long.
It is now 7.30. Good evening, everyone. So glad you're with us on this very special night, uh, election night here, midterm 2022. I'm Shannon Ogden. I'm Ann Trujillo. It's now been about a half an hour since the polls have closed here in Colorado. We are just starting to get some of those numbers in. One big race has already been called, and that's the uh, race for governor here in the state of Colorado. Our latest number is showing the governor was 61% to Heidi Ganahl's 37%. This has been a, a contested race here in Colorado. Uh, very few, um, um, what's the word? I can't even come up with the word, where they have met face-to-face, -face, but they have, debates, yeah. they have been fiery when they have met face-to-face -face in those debates. Absolutely. All right, our next race, uh, ABC News called that, by the way, um, uh, our next race for the Attorney General. I uh, have no data on this one. Let's skip through the uh, the Attorney General, where uh, the incumbent, Phil Weiser's is uh, trying to fend off John Kellner. Secretary of State's race, also right now, uh, zero data on this one. Again, we're just uh, mopping up some, some data here. Yeah, and I'm going to check the uh, Secretary of State's website here to see if we are getting any more specific information yeah. because we apologize that this is uh, not coming through at the moment. But we do know that there are some preliminary numbers in. So with the Treasurer's Office, for example, we know that uh, Dave Young has 54% right now to Lang size is 42%. Attorney General race Phil Weiser is leading 50 55% to 42%. So we do know that we have those preliminary numbers in All so right. far. The election center tonight, Rob Harris making his debut on the broadcast tonight. Rob? Yeah, so I'm here at the Democratic election headquarters, and uh, we're starting to feel the energy kind of tick up as those results come in, and they are looking good for Democrats so far. Shannon, you mentioned that ABC News called for Governor Jared Polis. No. We're hearing from many of the state leaders on stage. They're talking about how they're feeling good tonight, but they're also exercising caution. They said they're gonna wait for all the votes to be counted, everything to come in, but they're saying that they're feeling good, especially about that governor's race, which was called, as well as Senator Michael Bennett and Congressman Jason Crow. So those are the three that we're hearing from sources are prepared to give their victory speeches tonight. Some of the others, that might take more time for the ballots to be counted. So remains unclear if we'll hear from some of those other congressional races, specifically District 8. Uh, but we're watching that tonight as they start to come in and the supporters, too, who are very excited. Back to you. All right, Rob, thank you. Of course, one thing everyone's keeping their eye on is the balance of power, both on a national scale and certainly here at the state level. That's right. Megan Lopez and Tony Kobaleski, uh, both on this tonight. Uh, Tony, let's start with you. Well, I want to start with some of the governor numbers, and you just talked about it being called by ABC News. I think there's one teller telling county right now that's out there, and it's the numbers that have come in from Douglas County, which is traditionally a Republican stronghold. And you see here, Governor Polis beating Heidi Ganahl in Douglas County. Why was it called so early? Here's one of the reasons why. A significant early victory, but granted, there's 140,000 votes counted there in Douglas County. So for the governor to win in Douglas County, which has been moving more and more blue, but it's still considered a Republican stronghold, that's a significant story. Now let's go to balance of power and let's talk about the Senate. and and the, the numbers there, because we're going to be following that in Washington, D.C. And obviously we have the race here in Colorado that we've been looking at, and we've got about 140,000 votes there. Also, right now, Joe O'Day with a slight, well, a significant 51 to 46% to lead in Douglas County. But when you look at statewide, the numbers, Michael Bennett with that 58, 59% lead there, expected to win by close to double digits in that race. And then when we go look at the House races, the eight seats in Colorado, and how they will contribute to the balance of power. Megan has talked about that eighth district. We're gonna watch that closely. You can see the red and the blue on the map here right now. Right now, those, those districts going red, these going blue. According to analysts, there's three safe Democratic districts right now in the state and three Republican districts. The toss-up is, is seven, which is likely to go Democrat, according to many experts, and then eight. That's the district we're watching. It's either going to be that 4-4 split for Colorado sending four Republicans and four Democrats, or potentially a 5-3 Democratic send to Washington, D.C. So a lot to watch here. And throughout the night, we're going to take you inside those, those key counties to give you an idea of what and how these decisions are being made. But you saw off the top there, Douglas County right now going to the governor and race being called. That could be one of the reasons why it's so lopsided in that race. And Shannon?
Nope, Megan. Megan. <laughs> I'm taking a closer look at the state races here because we also have a balance of power that we need to be paying attention to that's going to be affecting people's lives uh, potentially even more really than Congress because these are really uh, the people that they send to the state house that could really pass laws a lot quicker. So here you're looking at uh, the house. This is 65 seats. All 65 are up for grabs. Want to show you a quick breakdown of the current seats. Democrats hold a 17 seat advantage in the chamber. They hold 41 seats to Republicans, 24 seats. Now, Democrats in general have a large total fundraising advantage so far that they've spent on this election. The other thing that we're going to be keeping an eye on when it comes to the House is really the leadership once all this is over. On the Democratic side, House Speaker Alec Garnett and Majority Leader Denea Escar are both out. They were term limited. Meanwhile, on the Republican side, uh, Republican House Minority Leader Hugh McKean passed away, unfortunately, uh, earlier this month. And then you had Tim Geithner, another uh, big name in the House Republicans, uh, who's also out. So that's really going to be interesting to kind of pay attention to how the House leadership really falls uh, comes together. We're watching 16 races there. Now let's go ahead and take a look over at the Senate. Uh, you have 35 seats, not all of them up for grabs this election, but this is the current breakdown that you've got right now. You've got 21 seats for Democrats that they control right now, while the Republicans hold 14 seats. It was 20 seats, but then Senator Kevin Priola switched his party affiliation in August uh, from Republican to Democrat, making it a little bit more difficult for Republicans to actually clinch this. But this is the chamber that you're going to want to pay attention to when it comes to the state legislature. This is the one that Republicans think that they can turn. And if they can turn it, if they can garner enough seats, they will be able to break up that Democratic trifecta. They'll be able to slow down in a very significant way um, some of the legislative uh, priorities that we've kind of seen kind of coming through uh, that Democrats were pushing through, that Republicans would do things like speak long to the night, filibuster. Um, so this is really what we're going to be paying attention to here. Now there's 17 seats that are up for re-election this year in the state Senate. Democrats are favored to win four. Republicans are favored to win six. That means we're watching seven of those in particular. We'll um, break down some of those ones that we're watching in particular, but one of them um, is going to be Nick Heinrichsen. He is the senator that's representing Pueblo right now. He was appointed to that position. And the reason he was appointed to that is because um, uh, Leroy Garcia took a job with the Pentagon. So this will really be his first chance to see, you know, if the voters like him. He was appointed um, via a vacancy committee. Something else that we're going to be paying attention to here is the leadership because it is going to be changing just a little bit. The Democrats still have Senator Steve Finberg and Dominic Moreno who have been leading the party in that chamber, but the Republicans, uh, St uh, Senator Chris Holbert and Senator John Cook, big forces in the Republican Party in the state Senate, they're both out. They were term limited, guys. All right, we have some breaking news right now. We just learned from ABC News that they have called the U.S. Senate race here in Colorado. And Michael Bennett is now um, is now maintained his seat. And that was one early that they thought would be tight, and the Republicans had a chance to uh, to to flip. Um, and that that steam seemed to have kind of fall away in the last uh, the last couple of weeks. And uh, so uh, Michael Bennett will remain our United States Senator, as uh, as will our Governor Jared Polis. Both have been called. Both races have been called by ABC News tonight. All right, let's get back to Denver Seven's Colette Bordelon at the Republican Watch Party tonight at the DoubleTree. Yeah, and guys, I had the chance to chat with Eric Odland, who's running for that 7th Congressional District, just a little bit ago in the hallway. He was confident that he would be winning this race right now. Initial results showing that Brittany Pedersen does have a lead over Odland, but he still says he's probably staying up all night tonight. I've got to get the lay of the land and figure out how I'm going to best serve Colorado in District 7. My eyes are going to be on Colorado, not on Washington, D.C., I'm going to work for committee assignments, but my focus will be serving District 7 and my constituents, bringing unity. I know I won't have a mandate. It's going to be that close. But ultimately, I'm going to bring the people together. We're going to address the economy. We're going to address out-of-control crime. So those are his big plans if that race takes a turn and flips into office. These are just unofficial results right now for that race. He is saying, though, his adrenaline likely going to keep him up all night tonight. I'm sure he's not the only one here right now. A race that was looking good literally just seconds ago for the Republican Barbara Kirkmeyer for United States Congress District 8. Literally results just came in showing Yadira Caraveo with a slight lead over that race. We have been expecting that race to be tight, though, 
all night. And that lead only by a couple of thousand votes right now. These races so, so quickly to change right now, too, for the Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold's votes do show a lead over Pam Anderson. I know Republicans had a lot of hope in Anderson as a candidate who could kind of bridge the gap on both sides of the aisle, pull people from both parties for some votes. Right now, though, Griswold is showing a lead. We do have Heidi Ganahl. We have Joe O'Day here hoping to chat with them soon about what these initial results are looking like. I talked with the chairwoman of the Colorado Republican Party earlier tonight. She said all of the candidates are planning on accepting these results tonight, guys. All right, Colette with the Republicans tonight. Thanks, Colette. All right, and as she said, we just got some new numbers from the Secretary of State's office. And in that 8th Congressional District, Barb Kirkmeyer has lost the lead slightly. Yadira Caraveo now 49% to Kirkmeyer's 46%. So new numbers to calculate. We'll have more for you as more election results come in. All right, Denver 7 is your election headquarters, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Your Voice, Your Vote. Uh, we have some numbers to show you in the governor's race. Jared Polis, 61% to Heidi Ganahl's 37%. ABC has called this race for Governor Polis. And uh, those are the numbers as we stand right now. Another statewide race we're watching tonight. ABC News also has called Michael Bennett winning the U.S. Senate race, beating a political newcomer, uh, Denver businessman Joe O'Day, 58 uh, 39 percent. All right, so here in the studio with us, we have Republican strategist Laura Carno, Democratic strategist Steve Walter. This is going just as just as you planned, Steve. Well, <laughs> this is what I expected, actually. Look, Joe O'Day ran a very good campaign, in my view, but he had two or three major obstacles he couldn't overcome. Number one, nationally, the kind of the Trump crazy campaigns had to be super funded in Pennsylvania, in, in Ohio, in New Hampshire, in Arizona. By the time we got to Colorado, they were out of money. So he was, he was at a short stop there. And then the governor's race didn't help him here at all. Uh, Heidi Ganahl really brought the ticket down, I think, in a substantial way. Uh, and that didn't help O'Day kind of buoy his own race either. So a couple of major significant ob so, obstacles. So, Laura, in, in that race, 
uh, it seemed to me that um, the, uh, the Republican Senatorial Committee was like, let's see if this type of Republican can win now. Anti-Trump, in fact, very vocally said, right. if he runs, I'm campaigning against right. him. Uh, and, and is that the answer to the question right now, that that kind of um, Republican can't win right now in a big race? Well, if, if you look at the strategy, and I'm not part of the campaign, but if you look at that strategy, that this is not a state that Trump won. Right. So that actually looks like a very smart strategy not to be aligned um, with Trump. Um, the other thing is that Joe Day is not a rock-ribbed uh, social conservative. He was very moderate on um, on the abortion issue. And so you could look at that and say, you know, we we're talking about these suburban women I keep talking about. Um, d at the end of the day, when all of the numbers are in, did he um, pull in some of those suburban women because he was more moderate on social issues? Um, that, and honestly, the, it, it, this mm -hmm. is the one that surprises me yeah. um, because I thought this was going the to result be very or how close. Soon it, we got the result. Um, yes, and both. both. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> all of that um, because the polls were tightening and it looked like there was momentum in Joe O'Day's uh, camp uh, from you know two weeks ago polls to a week ago to the did, very recent. Did ones. he get those suburban women votes, and or did he lose hardcore Trumpsters who just failed? The vote on the, on the race at all. We'll find that out. In a couple right, of days. Uh, hardcore Trump Trumpers and also hardcore pro-life people. Yeah. Um, there, yeah. there are some you know folks that have been talking about that that they can't vote for a pro-choice pro person. Um, but are those enough to make that difference? And so, in retrospect, was he the right kind of Republican to run against Michael Bennett? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think Deborah Flora, who was um, who did very well in the um, in the assembly, uh, which was a I'll, I'll reserve my judgment on, <laughs> on the future of, of the caucus assembly, assembly process um, for on both sides in Colorado. Um, but I think had she been in an actual uh, primary, I think she was she would probably have been a very strong candidate and would have done very well against Michael Bennett. Uh, Oday was I, I was impressed by how uh, disciplined he was as a political yeah. newcomer. That's a big big stage for a new mm -hmm. guy. Let's switch over to the governor's race now. Uh, uh, thoughts on on that? I mean, uh, I don't see any great surprise there. Either one of you. Well, look, it was a kitty litter campaign, and that's always a terrible place to be. The, the furry thing uh, was just crazy. I don't know where, where that came from, what, why she decided Joe Rogan. to make the, yeah, 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 but she doubled down on it again a second time before she got, finally got off it. That didn't help Joe Day either, by the way. I think Joe Day was a great candidate for the Chamber of Commerce and the Rotary Club Republicans. Uh, they'll circle back. This is just the wrong cycle for him, perhaps, to run in. Yeah, and if we look at the history of um, of. Uh, governors in Colorado being unseated, um, it, it hasn't happened for 60 years. And so you can also say maybe Colorado likes its incumbent governors, wants to like its incumbent governors. Um, and it, you know, it was a, it's a tough race. I think this is the one that um, Republican analysts looked at um, all along and said, this is going to be our toughest uphill climb. Let's not forget $28 million. Um, every commercial that, that uh, came on everybody's TV um, was, was a Jared Polis commercial. That's really difficult to overcome when you're looking at folks who aren't us, not talking, talking about politics on a daily basis on purpose. Um, that's how they make their decisions on um, in some of those cases. Yeah, these were big money races, mm -hmm. but also Colorado has this this strong independent streak. So it's anybody's guess where all yep. those, especially unaffiliated now that we know that more and more have joined that that party. That's right. And speaking of the all the high uh, spending ads, uh, happy to report they're, they're done. They yes. are done. As of 5 o'clock, yes. we are happy. It's that not good for the station, done. though, is it? I just find Steve. All right, so let's go now to uh, Denver 7's Megan Lopez with more on these numbers that they are, now that we know that some of the races are, are finished. Megan? That's right. We're going to take a closer look at the governor's race because it was just called by ABC. I want to show you what the Secretary of State's website is showing uh, to kind of give you a, a closer idea of exactly why they're calling this. And, and what you can see is Jared Polis having, you know, 300,000, nearly 300,000 more uh, ballots returned in his favor than Heidi Ganahl's. Um, I want to take a closer look at the map as well. And Tony Kovaleski is going to get into the county by county breakdown. But a couple of things stood out to me on this map. Um, um, is here you have uh, Garfield County. This one is reporting Democratic. I expect that one to turn Republican as we start to see more of those ballots come in and more of the kind of um, the, the southern kind of portion of the state as well. Another one that's also reporting higher government uh, Democratic uh, turnout for the governor is going to be Douglas County. Now, this is one of 36 races across the country uh, for the governor. So 
This is just one of a lot of different races, uh, but 538 had, pro, uh, had forecasted this really to be in favor of Governor Polis by nearly 10 points. And, and he, in 2018, had a commanding lead about 10 points as well. So that's something that, you know, uh, we've been paying attention to, that we've known about. Governor Polis also largely outraised Heidi Ganahl, um in this campaign, just as he did in 2018, but by more than double uh, than 2018 really. He spent about $12 million on this race. So let's go ahead and go on over to Tony Kovaleski. Actually, what we're going to do, I think we're going to go uh, Governor Polis. Uh, as we said, he has been declared victorious tonight and is getting ready to speak uh, tonight at the Democratic Watch Party. But first, we're listening in to Lieutenant Governor Diane Primavera. We've made real progress delivering on that vision. Seeing our governor in action over the past four years, I've seen firsthand that he's smart, He's a caring and determined leader who's serious about problem solving. He's exactly who we need in this moment to lead us to brighter days ahead. And tonight, we see clearly that the people of Colorado agree. Colorado, we couldn't be more thankful for trusting in us to keep the, getting the job done for four more years. So I want to take a moment to thank the amazing campaign staff and volunteers who knocked on every last door, texted every last voter, and planned incredible events across all, all across Colorado. So please give them a round of applause. I'd also like to thank our wonderful cabinet and incredible staff in the governor's and lieutenant governor's office who've worked really hard over these past four years to help us reach our goals. And I also want to thank the loves of my life, my daughters and grandkids for being here with us tonight. As well as our other friends who came out here to support me tonight on this stage. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. So thank you all so much. We have hard work ahead of us, but Governor Polis and I are ready. So now it's my pleasure to welcome the best governor in the nation, our governor for the next four years, Jared Polis. Diane Primavera, everybody. Thank you to our Lieutenant Governor, to the team, Tonight, we've proven once again what a special place Colorado is, a place where we truly value decency and hard work, where we fight for our freedoms and we strive to ensure that every single person has the opportunity to succeed and get ahead. Truly, a Colorado for all, where there's room and a place for everybody to be themselves. I'd like to thank uh, my opponents, Heidi Ganahl, Daniel Neuschwanger, all of the candidates who fought hard, fought races, and brought forward their ideas. Now we must all come together to move Colorado forward. I'm so deeply honored that the people of Colorado have chosen to share in my belief that Colorado's best days are still ahead. As we plan for what's next, we draw from the lessons that got us to this outcome tonight. The fact is, we did something simple. We focused on issues that really affect people's lives. And we delivered real results. We focused on lowering costs and more freedom. We led with rational, data-driven COVID policies that supported personal freedom and responsibility and resulted in Colorado having the ninth lowest COVID death rate in the entire nation. We created free full-day kindergarten and universal preschool, which launches next fall. Not only, not only important for every child, regardless of their background or where they live or who they are to get a strong start, but it also saves families $5,000 a year, and that's what folks need right now. We got major commitments on getting to 80% renewable energy by 2030, and we're on track for 100% renewable energy by 2040 in the great state of Colorado. We delivered on the largest property tax cut for homeowners and businesses in the history of Colorado and two cuts to the state income tax. 
And we've also ended state taxes on Social Security income, ended sales tax on diapers, and we did a lot more to save people money. In fact, for my State of the State address, I sang 50 ways to save you money with credit to Paul Simon. We delivered over 100 ways to save you money, and we are hard at work to get even more done soon. And in many ways, most importantly, we've protected people's freedom, something we celebrate in Colorado. Free to love who you love, free to decide your own family's future in our amazing great state of Colorado and a Colorado for all. Because in Colorado, we offer something truly special, the idea that your choices belong to you and no one else. Our solutions are never based on whether they come from the left or the right or the middle or up or down, but whether they solve problems and make life better for Coloradans. And we celebrate good ideas from all perspectives to save people money and make our state an even more amazing place. I think about Carissa from Commerce City, who can finally stop rationing her life-saving medication because of Colorado's historic cap on the cost of out-of-pocket insulin. Yeah. Or Julie and Aaron, like so many parents, who are saving thousands of dollars a year thanks to free full-day kindergarten for every child. Or Giles, a small business owner who is able to thrive with the help of small business tax cuts and support and a strong business environment. Colorado, we've shown what progress looks like when we work together in a way that's practical and data-driven. And we've proven that saving people money and protecting our freedom is a great way to bring people together across our state and across our nation. And to me, that's what leadership is all about. It has been the honor of my life to have served as your governor for the last four years, and it will be my honor to continue serving as your governor for the next four years. And, and whether you voted for me or not, I will work as hard as I possibly can on behalf of you and your family, and I'll never stop fighting for a better future for the state that I love. And you can always rest assured that I will always do what's right for Colorado. Yeah. And we know that we have more challenges ahead, and we're gonna work together to face them. We're gonna use every tool that we have to save people money on education, community college and college, healthcare, housing. We need more affordable opportunities to live near where jobs are for purchase and for rent, so that your hard work creates the opportunity to build an even greater life for you and your family in our state, because we are the best state to live, to work, to raise a family and retire, and we're gonna work hard every day to make Colorado an even more amazing place. Place. We're going to continue to make our communities safer by investing in law enforcement and preventing crime before it happens. We're going to continue to aggressively tackle clean air and climate change, preparing for drought and wildfires while creating good paying jobs and making Colorado a safer place for everyone. As we take on this work, I couldn't ask for a better partner than our Lieutenant Governor, Diane Primavera. <laughs> But we also wouldn't be here today without a strong grassroots team. Some of you are in the room, some of you are still out uh, at polls. And I wanna thank everyone across the state who knocked on doors for us, who made phone calls, who shared your ideas at meet and greets. I was in Pueblo this morning and then Colorado Springs. Great reception. And I also owe a huge thanks to the members of my cabinet and our amazing staff, many of whom are here from the Capitol Office and the campaign. Let's give our team a great round of applause. And there are so many staff members who've done such great work, but I want to give a particular shout out to my incredible talented Chief of Staff, Lisa Kaufman. <laughs> Made so many contributions over the years. I'm honestly not sure where she sleeps, uh, and I wouldn't be where I am today without you, Lisa. Thank you. I also want to thank Jen Ritter, who managed my historic campaign in 2018, stepped in this spring uh, when my campaign manager had a baby boy. And I also give it up for Sarah Andrews, who managed my campaign this cycle. It's hard, Sarah, to, to, for me to be in a campaign and run the state, and you made that possible by running the campaign. Thank you for your great work. 
And of course, I want to thank my family. My parents, my sister and brother, our amazing kids, and Colorado is so fortunate to have our wonderful, for our wonderful first gentleman, Marlon Reese. Colorado, your trust in me means more than I can even possibly put into words. No matter what party you belong to, no matter who you voted for, or if you didn't even vote at all, know that I'll always fight for you, and I will always do what's right for Colorado. I believe to my core that Colorado's and America's best days are still ahead. And I can't wait to work with all the wonderful people across our state to build a brighter future for Colorado that we can be even more proud of. Thank you. God bless the great state of Colorado, and God bless America. there uh, congratulating his staff, all the folks who have helped him land a uh, successful campaign. Um, they call this race at 727 tonight. That's yeah. one of the earliest times, I think, in, in recent history that, that we can recall a governor's race being called this, Absolutely. this early in the night. And you know, as I'm listening to talk, I'm thinking half of his term was COVID. Half of his term were those daily press conferences of here's where we are now, here's what we know about this disease. That's not what he signed up for. What you never know what what's going to land in your lap uh, when you're a governor. Um, wow, what a what a term and, this has and been. And he talked about that, how that is uh, you, having a, a low rate of infection here in Colorado was something that he lowest, was yeah. very very proud of in our state. But you're right, it, it's something that no politician, no one has ever signed up for, and, and we managed to to get through COVID together. But uh, he has said this has been the honor of his life to serve as governor, and it's an honor to serve a second term as governor of Colorado. That's right. Also our honor to have these two fine folks with us, Laura Carno, a Republican analyst tonight, and uh, Steve Welch, excuse me, uh, we have uh, Governor Paulus talking to him live. First of all, congratulations on the win. I want to say, what is your message to Coloradans tonight? You know, I think what, what the message Colorado needs and America needs is really one of unity. So what I focus on is that whether you voted for me or not, or even if you didn't vote at all, just know that I'm going to work hard every day, do my best. I love this state, just as my opponents love this state. Uh, I'm going to work hard every day, and I'm always going to do what's right for Colorado, and that's going to be our focus. More housing that's affordable for rental and for purchase, better schools, and an even better uh, economic growth that really benefits everybody. You fulfilled a lot of campaign promises in your first term. What didn't you get done that you want to focus on these next four years? There's a lot ahead. We've got free full-day preschool and kindergarten for every family, saving families thousands of dollars. We're going to implement preschool starts next year. We've got to tackle housing and public safety. So you're going to see a lot of our focus on making Colorado one of the 10 safest states over the next five years. That's our goal. And in making sure that people have real opportunities to buy and to rent that people can afford so people can thrive in our state and businesses can thrive. You won by double digits here in Colorado. Do you plan to run for president? Uh, no, I, uh, this is a wonderful job best state in the nation. I'm exclusively 110% focused on doing what's right for Colorado and giving them my all. Anything you want to say about your opponent in this race? At a time, this, it was a very divisive race. I want to thank, you know, everybody who ran. Heidi Ganahl, Danielle Neuschwanger, everybody who ran because everybody contributes ideas. We learn from one another. We have a, a, a spirited discussion about the future of our state, and I'm really honored to, to work hard for everybody, whether they voted for me or not. I know that we don't know a lot of the outcomes of some of the key races, but if there is a sweep of Democrats in Colorado. Can we call Colorado a blue state? Colorado is a very competitive state. People want to vote for people who are going to work hard for them. We focus on saving people money and protecting our freedom. We're going to continue that focus, right? I, I think that Colorado is a state where the voters reward people that are working to make our lives better, and that's really what I work hard to do every day. Governor, congratulations and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Anna and Shannon, as you heard, Governor Polis going down the line talking to media. He talked about how his focus is going to be on saving people money. A huge double-digit win. Talked about a lot of the, the campaign promises he did fulfill, but he has a lot more he wants to do in his second term. He made clear he doesn't have any plans to run for president, which I think has been a conversation that some have had in the Democratic Party. And a, a big win for Governor Polis. We've heard that uh, Michael Bennett did a Oh, there
they're talking about Michael Bennett. We know that race has been called um, by ABC and another Democratic win. And the question is, is, what other races will turn blue? And I think that there's a lot of excitement in this room that they are going to sweep all of the key races. Some of them we may not know until later on this evening or tomorrow, but there's a lot of positive energy here at the Dem headquarters. And we will uh, continue to monitor as, as more acceptance speeches happen on the podium behind me. For now, we are live. I'm Jennifer Kowaleski for Denver 7. That's right. Two races called and many more to go. So thanks for joining us. Election coverage continues now on ABC News. The local election coverage continues right now on Local 3. Good evening and thank you for watching Denver 7 News on Local 3 on this very important election night. I'm Jessica Porter and I'm Amy Wattis. The polls in Colorado are now closed. Election workers are hard at work counting those ballots. Tonight we're tracking the biggest races in Colorado as results start to come in. So let's start with the race for governor. Incumbent Democrat Jared Polis is seeking a second term. He currently leads Republican Heidi Ganahl 59% to 39%. ABC News has already called this race for Polis. And in the race for 
U.S. Senate Democrat incumbent Michael Bennett is vying for a third term. He is leading Republican challenger and businessman Joe O'Day, and ABC News is also calling this race for Bennett. All eight of Colorado U.S. House seats are up for grabs tonight. It's the newly formed House District 8, eight though, in Adams and Weld counties that we're watching extra close because Republican Barbara Kirkmeyer currently is uh, behind uh, Yadira Caraveo, 49% for Caraveo, 47% for Kirkmeyer. Now let's get to tonight's special team coverage. Joining us in studio tonight, Tony Kovaleski and politics reporter Megan Lopez breaking down all those numbers as they keep on coming in. And we'll hear from them in a moment. And we'll also hear from Jacqueline Allen at Denver Election Headquarters. But first, let's start with Denver 7's Colette Bordelon and Jennifer Kovaleski. They're at the Republican and Democratic Party headquarters, respectively. Let's go first to Jennifer at Democratic Headquarters, where the party is on. Jennifer. Jessica, you can hear and feel the excitement and the energy in this room. It has already been a very big night for Democrats. We just spoke with Governor Jared Polis just a few moments ago. He won by double digits against his opponent, Heidi Ganahl. He talked about how he wants to move forward saving people money, and he has a lot of things he wants to accomplish in his second term that he didn't in his first term. He had a lot of wins during his first four years, but he talked to us about wanting to do more for Colorado and how excited he is to have the opportunity to do that. We do know that ABC is calling the race for Bennett. It has not been called in this room. They are waiting for AP to make those calls. We also saw with Polis that they basically let Polis make the call. So they brought him up to the podium behind me and that's when they announced that he had won the race. So they may do something similar with Michael Bennett, who we are hearing and, and others are saying has won the race in the U.S. Senate. And that is another big win for Democrats. And they talked about They've had all kinds of people up on the podium behind me. Senator Rhonda Fields, Tay Anderson just spoke, the school board member in Denver Public Schools. Just everybody excited to be here, excited to be a Democrat and talking about how they see the, the races all going blue. And whether or not that will actually happen is to be determined. There's a lot of races that we know will be close, including that 8th Congressional District. But I do want to share with you some, some sound from Polis from just a few minutes ago as he was accepting becoming governor for the next four years for his second term. Take a listen. I'm so deeply honored that the people of Colorado have chosen to share in my belief that Colorado's best days are still ahead. As we plan for what's next, we draw from the lessons that got us to this outcome tonight. The fact is we did something simple. We focused on issues that really affect people's lives and we delivered real results. You heard the governor, you heard those cheers in the room. There was lots of screaming and clapping and, and just a lot of enthusiasm throughout his entire acceptance speech. And he said that what they did was simple. He talked a lot about his policies during COVID, that they were data-driven data policies. And he believes that a lot of that won voters over. And he talked about uh, kindergarten and preschool and providing that for families and talked about how he wants to save more money in the future. So we expect to have more accepted speeches here on the podium behind me. The question is just how many. For now, we are live at the headquarters for the Democrats. I'm Denver 7's Jennifer Bobuleski. Now The night is still young. There are still a lot of races to be called. Let's check in now with Denver 7's Colette Bordelon. Yeah, Colette, what is the mood where you are at right now? It's a little bit different than where Jen was just at. Right now, the music did just start playing, but crowds not like what I'm imagining the Democrat Party is right now. We've got a small gathering of people kind of hugging the corners in this room right now. There are some people out in the hallways, of course, but right now this room, far from packed, some might even use the word empty, fairly quiet if it wasn't for this music. Now, of course, one of those races to watch tonight was that Congressional District 8, the race between Barbara Kirkmeyer and Yadira Caraveo. Right now, like you guys were just saying, that is a tight race, Caraveo, with a slight lead at around 49% over Kirkmeyer's 46%. We are expecting her to be here tonight. I believe I saw her. We are hoping to hear from her soon. But we did already hear from Eric Odland, who was saying he's planning on staying up all night. Kellner also watching and waiting. They're holding out. Haven't heard from anyone just yet. 
All right, thank you, Colette. And as we mentioned at the top, one of the big races tonight is the race for newly formed House District 8 and Weld in Adams counties. Now let's turn things over to Denver Simmons politics reporter Megan Lopez. Hey there, guys. I'm trying to pull up the results for you here on the Secretary of State's website, um, but it's been really kind of a back and forth that we've seen all night. It's not really all that unexpected at this point uh, in general because of how the ballot returns are coming in. Uh, we had seen a lower voter turnout overall. Um, so again, not that unexpected to see. Here we go. Um, to see that kind of back and forth right now. Right now they have Yadira Caraveo ahead 49% uh, to 46% leading by about 4,000 votes. But I do expect that to change. Um, and the reason is because there's been so much emphasis on Barb Kirkmeyer potentially winning 538 forecasts said it strongly favored to Barb Kirkmeyer. So taking a closer look at what we're kind of seeing so far, you've got a lot of reporting happening so far in Weld and in Adams. And, and this is a three county district. It also includes Larimer. The interesting part about this district is that Weld County is going to be more Republican. Adams County is going to be more Democratic. That's kind of why you have such a close race right now. Larimer County is going to be the place to watch. Also going to watch Latino voters and also going to, to really watch that unaffiliated population. It's 46%. Now, even though Governor Polis and uh, Senator Bennett have both won re-election, the Democrats did warn me that those might be the only races that clearly are called tonight. So it could be a very late night, particularly in districts like District 8. So we're going to be keeping a close eye on the numbers, but I'm not holding my breath tonight. I think, Megan, we're definitely going to see some late results and probably some races not called for quite a while, including that one. Well, a big story tonight has been the long wait times in the hours before the polls have closed. This is the video from the voting center at the Emily Griffith Technical College, where wait times were more than an hour in the hours before the polls closed. Yeah, Denver 7's Jacqueline Allen. She is live at Denver election headquarters where a lot of people, as you saw, they were waiting until the last minute to vote. So final results could take a long time to come in, Jacqueline. A lot of last minute voters who waited until day today. We saw those long lines. In fact, here at the election headquarters, we saw people banging on the doors after 730. Polls closed at 7, trying to get their ballots in. Now, the good news is one theme of this election has been concern about poll workers. There's been a frenzy of activity here as these election judges start to process these ballots. The good news is that we have no reports of any threats here against these judges, poll workers, or election officials. And that is what the goal was here, making these guys safe. Here's what Denver clerk and recorder Paul Lopez had to say about that. It's really unfortunate that's the time that we live in, but we prepare for it. They're always trained. They're trained throughout their, uh, throughout their process. These are veteran uh, poll workers, so they're doing a great job. And I want to say that I, another theme of this election was making sure your vote counts. We got to see behind the scenes, get a tour, and saw how all of this is going. Now, the good news is Lopez says because of some of the new machines that they have, they should be able to get all of the votes that are in their custody scanned by midnight tonight. Reporting live at Denver Election Headquarters, Jacqueline Allen, Denver 7. Good to see everything going smoothly there, though those lines were pretty long this evening. They sure were. Thank you, Jacqueline. Well, coming up next on Denver 7 News on Local 3. Yeah, Megan, we'll take a look at the ballot initiatives being decided across the state. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to this election night edition of Denver 7 News on Local 3. Colorado voters are not only deciding state offices and seats in Congress, and we just got a big push of statewide numbers, so let's get to some of those right now. Starting with the numbers for governor, Governor Jared Polis leading Heidi Ganahl by 59% to 39%. That race has been called by ABC News for Governor Polis. And taking a look at the U.S. Senate race, Bennett is leading at 56% to Joe O'Day, Republican Joe O'Day, 42%. And ABC News also did call that race as well. Moving on now to the race for attorney general. Looking at the numbers, Phil Weiser leading by 55% to John Kellner's 30 or 43%. Excuse me, that race has yet to be called. And the House District 8 Congressman, Congress seat, I should say, 50% Yadira Caraveo. She is leading right now that race to Barbara Kirkmeyer at 47%. And of course, we're going to keep on following these results for you as they come in throughout the night. The District 8 race being watched very closely tonight. Let's now get to Megan Lopez live in our election center. Megan. Hey there, guys. It's not only some big names that are on the ballot this time around, but also some big ballot measures. So I wanted to go over some of those results, the early results that we're kind of seeing so far. We're going to start with Proposition FF. That is for healthy school meals for children. Uh, right now, you can see, according to the Secretary of State's website, it's doing quite well, 55% to 44%. Again, early results, but right now it's doing well. Uh, that's going to limit, um, what it's going to do is it's going to limit tax deductions for people earning $300,000 or more to offer free school meals uh, for all public school students. Those people earning $300,000 or more would be limited to $12,000 for tax deductions for individuals, $16,000 for joint filers. Let's go ahead and move on though. I want to talk about Proposition 121 next. This one is a tax decrease. It's going to move Move the state income tax from 4.55% to 4.4%. What you're looking at is the Secretary of State's website. I gotta say, guys, this one's not really a surprise, though, because uh, income tax measures, tax reduction measures in the state, they always seem to do well. I can quickly show you the map for where it's doing the most well, and well, all that green is where a tax reduction is doing really well. So that's not really a surprise. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to 122. This is the psychedelics one, saying that it would allow these psychedelic mushrooms to be decriminalized in some measures and allow these um, healing centers to come into Colorado. This one is a really tight race right now. You've got it winning so far, but really narrowly by like 1%. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, you know, still up in the air at this point. A couple others that we're paying attention to, Proposition 123, this is affordable housing. This one, another really close one at this point. So too close to call, obviously, still early results. 50% saying yes so far to 49% saying no. That would save some of your Tabor refunds uh, that you would potentially get and, and rededicate it to, to affordable housing. Now let's talk about one one of the most interesting set of topics that is booze so so far all of the booze measures are, are doing re, um, kind of interestingly um, the liquor licensing one is losing wine and grocery stores narrowly winning and the third party delivery is losing right now so keeping an eye on all those ballot measures And thank you for watching this Denver 7 News election night update. I'm Andrew Heal. And I'm Shannon Ogden. Glad you're with us tonight. I want to take a quick look at some of the big statewide races that have already been called here tonight. We're going to start uh, with, uh, actually we're not. We're going to start with the, uh, the new congressional district, House District 8. Um, okay, on to the governor now. Uh, governor Polis will get a second term here as uh, head of the great state of Colorado. And let's move on to the U.S. Senate race. Senator Michael Bennett, this race also been called. He has secured re-election. He's held the seat since 2009 when replacing Ken Salazar. Bennett beat political newcomer Joe O'Day and had the latest numbers show 56% to Joe O'Day's 42%. All right, let's now go to Denver 7's Jennifer Kovaleski, who's joining us live from the Democratic Watch Party. You just finished speaking with Governor Polis after that big win. 
and you can feel and hear the excitement in this room. It has already been a really good night for Colorado Democrats, and the question is just how good of a night will it continue to be? We did speak with Governor Jared Polis just a few minutes ago. He was on the stage behind me giving his acceptance speech to a packed room. They were excited. He talked about how he wants to continue saving people money in his second term, how he wants it to be a Colorado for all, and he wants to continue some of his campaign promises that he didn't fulfill in his first term he wants to do in his second term and a big focus of that was again on saving people money now I want to share with you what he had to say when he was accepting here just a few minutes ago I'm so deeply honored that the people of Colorado have chosen to share in my belief that Colorado's best days are still ahead as we plan for what's next we draw from the lessons that got us to this outcome tonight. The fact is we did something simple. We focused on issues that really affect people's lives and we delivered real results. And those results led to Governor Polis with a double digit win over his opponent, Heidi Ganahl. Now we are expecting more acceptance speeches on the podium behind me. We know that the race for U.S. Senate has been called for Michael Bennett. We are expecting him to make a speech here in the, in the near future. And we are hearing that it appears that uh, the Secretary of State's race and the AG's race were also leaning towards the Democrats. And that would be Jenna Griswold and Attorney General Phil Weiser. So we will continue to uh, stay here where it's very exciting uh, in this room as as things uh, move forward all right Jennifer Kovaleski with the Dems thank you very much Jen we are still waiting other statewide races AG Secretary of State and Treasurer have not yet been called but those are the latest numbers now from the 8th congressional congressional district obviously very very tight race tonight uh, right now, Yadira Caraveo showing 49 percent to Barbara Kirkmeyer's 47 percent and this has been the race to watch here in Colorado and, and, and nationally all eyes have been on this race because this is our new congressional district in our state that uh, that uh, the entire country is watching as we speak. That's right and we still uh, we are still awaiting uh, Ed Perlmutter's seat that he uh, is uh, is not running for again in the seventh uh, that has not been called yet again so still a lot of results still coming in uh, tonight. Um, and, and like I said, we still have two more outstanding or three more outstanding uh, statewide races as well. But so far, uh, early in this uh, evening before 9 o'clock, uh, it's uh, been a good night statewide for the Dems. So switch on over to Local 3 for live local coverage the rest of the evening.
Welcome back to Denver 7 News on Local 3 on this important election night. Coming up, Denver 7 anchors Andrew Hill and Shannon Ogden will join us with an update on what's happening here at home. All right, let's take a look at some races happening across the U.S. In the Georgia Senate race, incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock, he uh, currently leads believe Republican challenger Herschel Walker. And we're gonna looking to get some results on that race. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll have uh, some graphics up right here for the race in Pennsylvania, the Senate race. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking to get some results on that, but uh, you know, let's talk about the uh, race for governor that has been called. Uh, <laughs> governor Jared Polis will get a second term. That race has been called by the AP tonight as well as ABC News. He currently leads Heidi Ganahl 59%. Uh, we heard from him, him earlier this evening uh, in an acceptance speech. Yes, and we are talking now about the U.S. Senate race here in Colorado. Michael Bennett leading at 56% to Joe O'Day at 42%. And that race, ABC News did call that race for Bennett as well. And another statewide race uh, that we've been keeping an eye on is the race for Colorado Attorney General. Currently, Phil Weiser uh, leading 55% uh, against uh, John Kellner at 43%. Uh, Phil Weiser is seeking a second term tonight. Yeah, all eight of Colorado U.S. House seats are up for grabs tonight. It's the newly formed House District 8 seat in Adams and Weld counties we are watching extra cl closely. Republican Barbara Kirkmeyer, she is actually trailing behind Yadira Caraveo. Caraveo is at 49% to Kirkmeyer at 47%. It's a very close race. Let's take a look at House District 3 now, if we can get some graphics up for that. That is where Republican Lauren Boebert is hoping to keep her seat. Uh, she is being challenged by Democrat uh, Adam Finch. Let's go over to... Colette Bordelon for some team coverage. Or I'm sorry, I should say Tony Kovaleski. He is actually here in the studio tonight as well as politics reporter Megan Lopez breaking down the numbers as they come. And now we are going to take it over to Colette Bordelon. She is... All right, we're going to speak. We're tossing to Bennett now, who is currently speaking. I want to thank my family. First and foremost, Susan my wife Susan and my daughters, <coughs> Caroline, Helena, and Anne. And Susan, I want to thank the women with Bennett that Susan organized and put together with Cassie Carlson. They made a huge difference in this election. I want to thank my campaign team led by Justin Lamort. He did an incredible job. They did an incredible job. There he is, right over there. If, you, if you're looking for a campaign manager, that's the guy that you want. And I want to thank my Senate staff, both here in Colorado and in Washington, D.C., led by Amy Friedman, who's done just an amazing job. And I want to thank the volunteers on this campaign who worked tirelessly up to 7 o'clock this evening to make sure we got the result that we knew Colorado could deliver. Yes. It's been such a privilege to travel this state over the last few months with the other elected Democratic leadership who now know that they have won their races. Our great governor, Jared Polis, the best governor in America. <laughs> Joe Neguse, Jason Crow, Diana DeGette, Phil Weiser, Jenna Griswold. We're still waiting to hear Dave Young's Dave Young's treasurer seat called, but I am absolutely sure he's gonna come through. Brittany Pedersen in CD7. And I want you to give a round of applause to Ed Perlmutter for the amazing job he did serving this state. We're still waiting to see whether Yadira is going to win, but when I came down here, she was ahead in CD8. I hope she wins. I've been living in Adams County wanting her to win. And, and Weld County. Thank you. 
and she's doing well. She's doing well in Weld County. And then Adam's ahead in the third CD. <laughs> Let me just say a few words since I have you here tonight. And, and, the, and what I want to tell you, thank you, thank you. What I want to tell you is why we won this campaign in Colorado. And we won this campaign because we told the truth from the beginning to the end of this election. We said the same things in red parts of the state and blue parts of the state in our primary and our general election, we told the truth. And we focused on the struggles of working people in this economy. And some of you have heard me say this a million times, but if I had to summarize my town halls in the time that I've been in the Senate, it's very easy to do it. And this was before we were dealing with the inflation we're dealing with now. It's families coming and saying, Michael, we are working incredibly hard. We're killing ourselves. And no matter what we do, we can't afford some combination of housing, of health care, of higher education or early childhood education. We can't save. And this is the anecdotal reflection of an economy that for 40 years has worked really well for the top 10 percent of Americans and hasn't worked for anybody else. And this is this was not an accident. There's been a 40 year Washington consensus since Reagan basically was president that said, we're gonna privilege people in our society that wanna make stuff as cheaply as possible in China or Southeast Asia over lots of other choices we could have made like our own supply chains, like our national security, like being able to earn a decent wage in the United States of America. And as a result of those policies that Washington still has not corrected, as we stand here tonight, we have the worst income inequality that we've had in a century in the United States of America. We are the richest country in the world, and we have the third highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. And I think that's unacceptable. I think that is unacceptable. We have to change that. That's why I was so glad when we included my enhanced child tax credit last year and passed it, and we cut childhood poverty in America almost in half last year. We cut, we cut hunger by a quarter. You know, and we've done some really important things that we've been fighting for for a generation, like, cutting dr like capping drug prices for seniors at $2,000 requiring Medicare to negotiate drug prices on behalf of the American people. Finally, finally. And passing a climate and energy bill that's going to be able to reduce costs in this country. It's going to enhance our national security. And finally, we're going to drive emissions down. This country is now positioned to lead the entire world in this transition we have to make over the next 25 years, and Colorado is positioned to lead the country. But we've got to do more. I want to go back there to end childhood poverty. We need to address a health care system that still costs too much and doesn't cover enough Americans. We've got to fix, finally, our broken immigration system. We've, we have to secure the future of the Colorado River and the American West. And we have to give people a sense of economic opportunity again. And this is what I talked about on the trail in red parts of the state and blue parts of the state. And that's because when people lose a sense of opportunity for themselves and their families, that's when inevitably, in human history, somebody shows up and says, I alone can fix it. You don't need a democracy. You don't need the rule of law. You should expect your public sector and your private sector to be hopelessly corrupt, hopelessly bankrupt. That is the dark vision that Donald Trump ran for president on. That is the dark vision that he won on. And tonight, Colorado is rejecting that vision for our country. And we don't have a minute to lose, Colorado, because damage has already been done. 
because Donald Trump got elected under those circumstances and he appointed three right-wing judges to the Supreme Court and they stripped us of our first constitutional freedom, our first constitutional right since Reconstruction. And we cannot let the Supreme Court be the last word on a woman's right to choose. We can't do that. We have to elect pro-choice majorities in the Senate and the House. So I had a nice call from President Biden tonight. To my surprise, it actually turned out, it was to my surprise, he had just walked his dog and he hadn't taken his hat off. And they sent me a photograph of the hat he was wearing, the baseball hat he was wearing, and it was his Camp Hale baseball hat. You all know the story in Colorado, the story of Camp Hale, which now has become this administration's first national monument. And this story is an amazing Colorado story of some of the greatest mountaineers and some of the greatest skiers in America came to Camp Hale to train in the 10th Mountain Division. And some people who had never seen snow before came to train in the 10th Mountain Division. And for two years, they trained on that mountain. I met a, I met a, the son of one of the Camp Hale vets who said to me, he said, when you see that mountain, think about my father, because he said, that was the coldest son of a bitch I ever climbed. <laughs> and they took two years to train, and then they went to Northern Italy, and they... We'd like to apologize for Michael Bennett's excitement there with his language <laughs> this evening. Uh, Michael Bennett, very fired up, just elected to his third term in office. He thanked his supporters and his staff and uh, had a very long victory speech there. He certainly did. Now we are going to hear from his challenger at the GOP headquarters, Joe O'Day. He is speaking live right now. Senator Bennett will use his seat for the good of this state, all four corners, Colorado matters. And again, thank you to my wife, family, for getting behind me day one of this campaign and always being in my camp. Thank you to the four horsemen that helped my finance committee and all the others that jumped in and did their part. We couldn't have done it without you. And thank you to all of Colorado for your love and your support. I look forward to better days. Don't look backwards, look forward. Colorado's a great state. We'll get some things done. It just may take us a little while. Thank you again for being here tonight. Appreciate it. concession speech, a very quick concession speech this evening from Joe O'Day. Uh, we just got the results this evening. Michael Bennett just gave his victory speech. He just was elected for his third term um, in the U.S. Senate. Yep, certainly. Well, thank you for joining us tonight on Denver 7. We'll be right back. We'll be right back.
All right, let's get some more perspective on tonight's elections. Joining us now are Republican analyst Laura Carno and Democratic analyst Steve Welchert. Thank you for joining us tonight. We've got a lot of results uh, finally coming in, but one race that's still very close this evening. Yes, we do have one race very close. It's the new 8th congressional seat that we are talking about tonight. We wanted to get your take on that race. Let's start with you, Laura. Yeah, so this is the one from the beginning of the evening that we were going to keep our eye on. It's a very, very competitive seat. Um, and uh, the what, what are we at, like 42 percent? Um, so we're looking at, um, at Adams County um, well, that's that is um, still leaning Democrat. The other two counties, Larimer and Weld, are leaning Republican, um, but it's still just such a close race. What are your thoughts? That's exactly right. I looked at the two underlying races, the State Board of Education and the CU Regent race in those in that congressional district. Those are both 50-50 races as well. So that gives you some indication that maybe all night long this will be a, a close race. I was involved in the very first ever uh, CD7 race back in 2002, and that was 950 votes, votes down from my guy on election night, end up losing by 119 uh, a month later. So this race could go that long as well, I suspect. And this race has had a lot of focus on it because of the implications mm -hmm. of gaining this extra House seat for either a Republican or Democratic candidate. A lot of money that has poured in as well, $11 million of independent and, uh, and PAC money. Um, will this have a, a big change, whoever wins, in, an, in the balance of power? in the U.S. House. What are your guys' thoughts? It well, certainly will. I mean, it'll either be a 5-3 state delegation or a 4-4 delegation going back to Washington, D.C. And as you see by the statewide vote tonight, we're really about a 6-2 state uh, by congressional district map, but, but that's how the commission drew it up. So we're going to find out what happens tonight with District 8. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and nationally, we're looking at so many other races mm -hmm. to see what's going to happen in the U.S. Senate, what's going to happen in Congress, um, and what that balance of power is going to be. Um, it Because we have a Democrat president for two more years, um, uh, do, can we get a, a big enough um, red majority in both of those uh, chambers to be able to stop uh, what's going on in the White House and uh, put a stop mm -hmm. to these these policies that are just tanking the economy. I did want to bring up, we just, uh, my producer told me in my ear that Colorado District 2's race was just called. Jonah yeah. Goose won that race, declared the winner. Any thoughts? Oh, just no surprise at all. That's a, that's a rock solid blue seat. Uh, it'd be like saying Lamb Ward's going to win in Colorado Springs, kind of the same dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, same. There, there are some that are just absolutely not surprises, and uh, that's one of them in Colorado. Jonah Goose keeping But his keep your eye on Jonah Goose moving forward. I think the next time there's a governor's race or Senate race in Colorado, Jonah Goose is likely to be a Democratic nominee. Hmm. So you think that yeah. things could be changing the next election? Uh, maybe next couple elections, sure. 24, 26, somewhere out there. You bet. Okay. Oh, a lot to look forward to, huh? Yeah. Absolutely. Do well, we have time for one more question? Yeah. <laughs> is there time for one more question? I know that um, we were talking more about the... Uh, how there's the balance of power in the Capitol kind of thing. Now, what's the expectation if there's a split, you know, like the Republicans win the House and the Democrats win in the Senate? For the State House or for the U.S. The House? The U.S. House. Oh, for the U.S. legislature. I, I think that's really the, the battle. I, I agree with Laura. I think that the Republicans will win the U.S. House tonight uh, nationally, but it won't be, won't be a tsunami. It'll be a tsunami, but it okay. won't be a tsunami. I think the Senate is really where the balance of power and uh, that's where things will stop pretty quickly from the House side. Yeah, and um, and whatever happens in the in the House, I think it'll be a it'll be a, a moderate wave. Let's say it that sure. way. Um, but I still think there's a chance for the Republicans to um, at least um, get a, a vote or two majority in the in the Senate. But even if it's just the House, being able to stop um, legislation. Um, Good yeah, luck no, would be great. No, Biden's not going to pass any legislation, that's for sure. I mean, but historically, it's about a 30-vote swing for the, the party in power in the White House. Mm -hmm. that we're going to lose seats. We're not going to lose 30 seats tonight, I don't think. It's probably closer to 15 or 20, I suspect. Yeah. Right. A lot of closely watched races, definitely. Well, thank you both for your perspective this evening. And Colorado voters are not only deciding state offices and seats in Congress, they're also deciding a lot of ballot initiatives. Let's send it over to politics reporter Megan Lopez. Hi, Megan. Hey there, guys. Some really interesting race is playing out tonight in some really interesting ways. I want to start with the boozy ballot measures. Uh, there were three of them that were on the ballot this year that voters were asked to decide on. So let's quickly run through them. Proposition 124 was about liquor licenses, allowing unlimited liquor licenses. Uh, most of the money for this race to prop it up actually came from a Maryland congressman and his brother that owned Total Wines. Right now, a resounding no to this so far. I want to show you the map, though, to show you why that is. And that's because um, 
There's not a single place in the state that seems to agree with it at this point. Still early with the results, but that's one that I think um, we can kind of see the trend of where it's going. The other one, Proposition 125, is about wine in grocery stores. You might know that there is some wine in some grocery stores. Uh, there's a lot of rules about why that is. Wine's not allowed in all grocery and convenience stores. This one is a really close one at this point. It's less than a percentage point difference. I mean, you're talking about 49.96% saying yes at this point, and 50.04% saying no. Let's take a quick look at the map to kind of show you why that is and how it's kind of playing out. And what it looks like really is you've got the Denver and the metro area saying yes so far, as well as parts of uh, southern Colorado, but really the rest of Colorado is saying no. Uh, one I think that I heard from these ones in particular is that it's really going to hurt rural liquor stores um, and could potentially drive them out of business. I think that's why you're kind of starting to see some of those play out. The last one is alcohol delivery. This one also pretty close, but still trending toward no at this point, with nearly 53% of people saying no. And this one, kind of similar to what you're seeing in um, the wine and grocery stores, you've got a couple of metro areas saying yes, but the rest of the state saying no. I spoke with liquor stores over the course of this election, and they said with all three of these combined, it would be the final nail in the coffin for many of Colorado's 1,600 liquor licensed family-owned stores. So they're really pushing for no for all three of these. Um, I guess I was expecting at least wine and grocery stores to be doing a little bit better than it is, but right now that's what we're seeing at this point. Let's pop up and talk a little bit about the affordable housing ballot measure. This one is a close one at this point as well. This one would bring more affordable housing into Colorado using Tabor money. Um, and so what you're seeing right now is really close. I mean, you're talking about a percentage point or two difference. We're keeping an eye on all of these guys, but a very interesting ballot issue night here in Colorado. All right, thank you, Megan, for following those so closely. Well, races here in Colorado and races across the country will determine the balance of power in Washington, D.C. For more on that, let's check in with Tony Kovaleski. Yeah, Amy, Jessica, the numbers are really fascinating. Let's start with the Senate balance of power here. There's 35 seats up for grabs nationwide right now in the Senate. Ten of those are considered competitive. And what experts are saying is whichever party can get five of those ten competitive seats will take over that balance of power on the Senate side. We're going to take you into Colorado's race here. And we've talked about Michael Bennett winning. And we're going to show you why he won. Take a look right now, 56% for Bennett to 41%. Those are the current numbers. Let's go back historically six years ago and see what Michael Bennett ended up with. Only a 50 to 44% win over then candidate Daryl Glenn. And if we take you inside the numbers right now with Michael Bennett and the key counties and how they broke out, remember, we've talked about that roadmap to get elected as a Democrat. You have to do well in Denver and Boulder counties. Look at what he did in Denver County. 80% of the vote for Michael Bennett on the Democratic side. Now you go up to Boulder, also a Democratic stronghold. 79% in Boulder County. Those numbers tough to beat. Let's contrast that and show you the two Republican counties that generally felt very strongly and what impact they had. Douglas County, Joe O'Day barely winning by five percentage points. It should be at least 60-40 if a Democrat is going to be challenged at all. And then you also go down to El Paso County, and again, 52 to 45 percent. This is the roadmap that got Senator Bennett elected. This is the roadmap that ultimately showed why the numbers are so large, a 56 to 41 percent race. Now, balance of power, let's move to Congress and show you those numbers. As we look at them right now, 65 competitive seats. Democrats had to win 49 of those seats to retain power. In our state right now, we have eight seats up for grabs. As we've talked at great length, that, that eighth district is probably going to go well past midnight before we have a decision. But this is a district that's interesting right now, and that's District 3. Lauren Boebert, the incumbent, she is trailing by 10,000 votes there, 52 to 47 percent. A lot of people watching this expecting Boebert to win, but not by the 6 percent she won by two years ago. Right now, she's trailing by 10,000 votes, and we are going to keep a close eye on that because that could be a significant turn for the Democratic Party in this state and the balance of power. So a lot happening right now on the congressional side. Senate race already decided in Colorado. We're taking a look at that balance of power nationwide and we'll continue to monitor it throughout the night. Jessica, Amy.
When I go through these Listen, elections, a, uh, I say to people that uh, after it's, it's over, and even while it's years. going, I'm morally obligated to represent everybody in the state, whether they voted for me or not. Well, I spend more time probably in red parts of the state than blue parts of the state from because of my work on the Agriculture Committee and the work that I've done to bring resources to, to Colorado to deal with you know, the condition of our forests, to protect our watersheds, the infrastructure over over. that we're building all over Colorado tonight, uh, and my fight you know, to create a tax, set of tax policies in America that actually help Here's working people instead of only wealthy people. I've been it's a lot something about that is where Colorado is, you know, and I feel comfortable after all these years that I'm where Colorado is as years. well, and I'm grateful to have and the kind the of Dobbs win we had tonight. Out, what do you think was key to, to winning your the race tonight? I think the most important thing was, uh, you know, for, for all the time that I've been in Washington, or I've been in the Senate, you know, I've been fighting to say, We've got to stop the trickle-down economics of the last 40 that years emotion, that basically started when Ronald Reagan was president, and, and which but is creating is real difficulty for people living in our it's state who can't afford housing or health care or higher education or early childhood education. We need an economy that when it grows, it grows for everybody to give people some hope that they can the move their families ahead. Otherwise, you know, that's when somebody like Donald Trump shows up and says, I alone can fix it. You don't need a democracy. And I believe in democracy. Democracy. I love democracy. I think it's really important for us to sustain it, but you can't do it if you're stand, there, got to stand for freedom and for opportunity. And that's what attention. we need to do. And um, and then I think you know the, another issue that was important in the race was um, the Supreme Court's reversal of, of Roe versus Wade, which you know was a 50-year freedom, that we, the, a constitutional right that now has been taken away. No that was something that I think also you know, had an effect in the election. It does not happen on you said during your acceptance speech that democracy was on the line with this election. That's a strong thing to say. Why did you say that? Well, I believe that in this sense, and it's different from what other politicians have said around the country. My, the reason I believe that is because of the difficulties we're having in our economy. You know, we have the worst income inequality that we've had in a hundred years. We are we have we are the richest country in the world and we have the third highest rate of childhood poverty. And that's that's what I mean because these things are tied together. If people don't see economic opportunity for themselves, you know, that's when in, throughout human history, they sometimes give up on democracy. They sometimes say, you know, what we really need is a strong man to, 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 to govern because that person will at least give us opportunity. And what I'm saying is we got to create that opportunity here in the country, and I believe we can. I think we will. Are you concerned about the balance of power shifting in Washington? Well, I don't know yet tonight what is going to happen. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that when it when it comes. I haven't had any trouble finding Republicans to work with in the Senate over the years. And if there's a divided House and Senate, um, we're going to find a way to continue to get stuff done. I hope that the new House leadership, if they are Republican, you know, can stand up for themselves and stand up for their membership and not be kind of imposed upon by outside forces like our friend in Mar-a-Lago. Last question. How would you describe the night for Colorado Democrats? It's been a great, no, I think it's a great night for Colorado. That's what I would say. And a great night for the country, you, you know, the candidates that ran, I'm so proud to have run with you. the people that I ran with, from Jared Polis to the rest of these candidates. These are serious what people. Are they're not, In they're not, home. they're not soundbite people. They're, 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 they're less, less politicians than they are public servants. And well, we that's what I think Colorado wants, and that's now what Colorado's going to have. And we will make the same Senator, sacrifice. Senator, I appreciate Senator. your time. We Congratulations. Yes, Thanks. you as well. Carry it forward. That is our decision.
Oh, good evening, everybody. Glad you're with us tonight. Coloradans tonight making their voices heard in this high stakes midterm election. Voters getting the final word on reshaping the political landscape here in Colorado and on Capitol Hill. All right, so here's what we have right now at this hour. Diana DeGette, a handily won uh, for re-election in uh, District 1 there. Also, Joe Nagus has won re-election in the second congressional district, easily beating his competitor 71 to 28 percent. Now, early in the evening, of course, the governor's race here was called. Actually, we're going to the seventh, it looks like right now. So the Associated Press has called Brittany Pedersen uh, victorious over Eric Odlin. A very close watch. This was the uh, the one to replace Ed Perlmutter, who decided not to want to win again. So a lot of money spent on this one. Uh, Brittany Pedersen comes out ahead for District 7. And now to the Colorado governor's race. And again, as you well know, this race was called early. 59% uh, for Jared Polis to Heidi Ganahl's 40%. All right, to the United States Senate. This was the first one called for the evening. ABC News called this one very, very early. Uh, Michael Bennett wins re-election over political newcomer uh, Joe O'Day here, 56 to 42 uh, percent right now. So Bennett will continue serving the state of Colorado uh, in the United States Senate. All right, now to the 8th Congressional District. And this is the race to watch and it is so close right now 49 percent for yadira caraveo barbara kirkmeyer with 47 percent this is colorado's newest district and uh just too close to call right now and this is one that will probably go late into the night we may yeah. not even get an answer to this race tonight it's that close so we have live election team coverage for you on this uh, election night in Colorado. Denver 7 political reporter Megan Lopez breaking down the key races and issues. Colette Bordelon, she's at the GOP watch party where Republicans are optimistic tonight that record high inflation prices, they're hoping that those will sway voters in Colorado in some of these key races. All right, let's begin there with Colette at the GOP headquarters tonight. Colette? Yeah, and Heidi, Heidi Ganahl did concede to Governor Jared Polis. She sent out a statement of that concession. I want to read part of that statement to you guys. It starts out saying tonight did not go the way we had hoped and prayed for, but I know this movement is real. This mom on a mission is proud to have given a voice to the army of mad moms, dads, and grandparents of Colorado who are scared about what the future of our beautiful state holds for our kids and grandkids. She continued to say, Governor Polis, I wish you well and my prayers will be with you. She actually left this party and had her concession speech at a different location, but Joe O'Day also conceding to Michael Bennett. He was just on that stage, short, sweet concession speech. We'll give you a listen of what he said. We are very disappointed with tonight's results. So many people poured their hearts, their souls into this race. We all did. And the outcome is a tough pill to swallow. But that's life in the big city. We fought hard. We competed. We stayed true to our core and our beliefs. tonight at the Republican Party in Colorado. One of those speeches is supposed to be coming from John Kellner, who was running for that AG position. We'll keep you posted on when those happen, guys. All right. Colette, Colette thank you. Borlon with Republicans this evening. Our election team coverage continues now. Megan Lopez and Tony Kovaleski, very busy tonight breaking down a contentious race uh, for governors. We've done that. Megan, uh, a lot, a lot of money in the run-up to Election Day. Yeah, that's right. And it's not really surprising with Governor Jared Polis. We've seen him infuse a lot of money into his campaigns in the past. Back in 2018, he had infused uh, and, and had more than $23 million for his campaign. This time around, he has about uh, $12 million for his campaign. That far outweighed Heidi Ganahl. She only had about $2.5 million. Something that's interesting, though, is I was talking to the Democrats earlier today. They expected to see the Senator Bennett race called early. They expected to see the Governor Polis race called early. But something that we had asked them as reporters is, what really moves Colorado to a blue state? Uh, for years, it's really been described as this purple state. And they said that they don't consider Colorado, even with some of these big wins, to be a 
blue state at this point. They didn't consider this to be a blue wave year or a red wave year. What they really considered this year to be is a make of it what you can year, at least here in Colorado, because we are starting to see some of those red waves that we've seen nationally kind of fall short here in Colorado. Um, and so they said that they're not really considering this a blue wave. Something that they did mention is that they would be worried if a Liz Cheney type character ran on the Republican Party, you know, here in Colorado, and they think that they would have a good chance winning here in Colorado. So that's why they're not considering it a blue state. There's still a lot of different races to be determined. But the Democrats told me that the thing that they're going to be watching is these state Senate races. They said the state legislature is really where they're going to be counting if they won or not. Um, and so let's take a look at a few of them, if that's all right, guys. Um, we've got seven in particular that we're keeping an eye on that could really shift the balance of power in the state Senate. And right now, all of them are leaning toward the Democrats. You've got Senator Nick uh, Heinrichsen um, running for the first time here, and he's winning. Dylan Roberts is doing well. He's representing Eagle County. Tony Exum is doing well. This one, District 15, is a really interesting one. I was uh, thinking that uh, Senator Woodward would do well, uh, but Janice Marchman so far is doing well. You've got Lisa Cutter in the 20th District doing okay, and uh, My Kyle Molica in the 24th District doing well, and then finally Tom Sullivan running for the 27th District. So Democrats doing well. The ballots they did, the Democrats did return their ballots earlier, so these could change, but so far looking good for the Democrats, guys. All right, Megan Lopez, thank you very much for all your work tonight. We'll check back in with you in a little bit. Tony Kopaleski uh, joins us now by uh, with a county by county breakdown of what we've seen here in Colorado so far. Tony? You know, Shannon, here, here's the headline tonight. This has to be a wake-up call for Colorado's Republican Party. You heard Megan talk about it a little bit. They're expecting a red wave possibly today in Colorado. There's not even a red trickle. And let me show you some of the numbers and why. Governor Polis with about 59% of the vote right now coming in in the governor's race. Let's go back four years and see what that number was. 53 to 42. So he's even expanded his popularity there. Let's look at the AG's race right now. Weiser with about a four percentage point lead in that race. But remember, this was four years ago against Brockler. Let's now look at that now, and you'll see he's broadened his lead to 54 to 43 again in just four short years. Let's look at the Senate race and what happened with Michael Bennett. These are 2022 numbers, a 14 percentage point lead up there. Now let's go back six years ago in the Bennett race, the last time he ran for Senate, he only won by six points over the contender there. So what you're seeing in these numbers is the Republican Party has not done well in Colorado today, a day they expected some sort of bump because of the economy, maybe because of crime. We haven't seen any of that. Let's go look at the House races right now, and that is also telling at this point. And we're going to go to 2022, and you will see that's balance of power. Now here are the eight races in Colorado, and, and this one is probably most telling right now. If the Democrats can upset Lauren Boebert, an 8,000 vote difference right now, also have to realize and couch that with the Republican vote generally comes in later. So Boebert expected to do well as we go on to the night, but still leading at this point with 240,000 votes cast. That is telling, and obviously that that eighth congressional district we're going to be watching well past 11 o'clock tonight. So bottom line, any thought of a Republican move in this state tonight, there's no sign of it. Back to you guys. Tony Kovaleski tonight. Thanks, Tony. Uh, in the studio, we are so lucky to have with us Republican strategist Laura Carno and uh, our Democratic strategist tonight, Steve Welter. And, and I think th the two races that we have to talk about, the third and the eighth, all the others, the other congressional districts we know are set. Yeah. What, what's happening? What, what's your assessment so far? Lauren Boebert, this is a surprise, or is it that she's behind right at the moment? Th this is all going to be about um, where these day of voters uh, came in. Um, the same day voters, the lines that we that we saw um, at the earlier broadcast, um, we were hearing in different counties that there were big lines. So um, who are the who are those last day voters, day, um, election day voters, and, and where did they go? I think those are going to go to Boebert. I think those are going to go to uh, Barb Kirkmeyer. Because there, there was talk that there was a push from, from the Republican side that they were telling their voters to show up 
late to the polls tonight. Do you right. think that th was that true? Is that is that what we're seeing? Um, I, I absolutely have heard this. I'm not one of those who waits um, till the day <laughs> of um, um, because we do have a lot of, of opportunities. But absolutely, I'm, I'm hearing um, lots of people out there saying that they feel that their vote is safer if they vote the day of. I think voting is relatively safe, um, but but there are a lot of people who um, who believe that and we're showing up. We heard in El Paso County, for example, not part of either the third or the eighth, but we heard in El Paso County at eight o'clock that, that people were still in line to vote. Mm. Uh, so who are those same day voters and, and uh, who are they voting for? And I think they're gonna lean to the Republicans in both of those cases. So Steve, on the, um, uh, the national narrative certainly has been that everywhere, no matter where you go, this is an election about Trump and Biden. And uh, are, are we seeing that in Colorado as much as you can tell? We sure are. Um, this was a Biden plus 13 state two years ago. It's still a Biden plus 13 state today. The fact that we're talking about Lauren Boebert be, even being in jeopardy is a really dramatic story in my view. I, I, that's the story of the night almost. Um, and CD8, we won't know for days, I don't think. Well, that would be a long time down there. And why do you think that is? Well, I, I, th I think that crazy doesn't play in Colorado. And whatever red wave, however big or small it might be, happening uh, coming across the eastern part of the country is hitting the rocks of Colorado, stopping here, and it's not going to go any further. Arizona's good. Colorado's good. Um, the red wave is not happening here. All right. Laura? Um, you know, when we showed up this evening, um, we all thought I'd be smiling much bigger tonight <laughs> on a lot of these races. So, um, th and that's the question. Um, there, there was obviously a red wave in some, um, some early states and what the heck happened as it got here. And, and I think Republicans do need to have some soul searching, um, especially here in Colorado. Uh, I think we had great candidates on our, uh, for our statewide um, races. Uh, there, there, were, there were some, um, in the primaries, there were some candidates that uh, would have, I think, done significantly worse tonight. So I think we had some really great mm -hmm. candidates um, up on the Republican side. So what the heck happened? Who turned out, I think, will be the big question. All right, Lauren, Steve, can you stick around for a little bit longer? Thank you. I'm glad you're Appreciate here tonight. It. All right. Thanks. All right. We want to, uh, are we going to take a break here right now? Is that what we're doing next? Okay, we'll take a break and be right back.
And welcome back to our election night coverage. Multiple statewide issues will have wide ranging impacts if passed. And for some political reporter, Megan Lopez, joining us once again. So give us a better understanding, Megan, about the historical precedent potentially being set here tonight. Well, one of the pieces of historical precedent that we could be setting is with the psychedelic substances. I'll talk about that one in just a second, Anne. I wanted to start, though, with uh, this charitable binging, that, uh, bingo. That's Amendment F. It's uh, losing pretty significantly at this point. This one is a constitutional amendment. It requires 55% voter approval in order to pass. Uh, and this one was on the ballot almost exactly the same way, the exact same wording, uh, back in 2020, and it failed as well. So the proponents said with more funding, they were going to try again. Fortunately, it just doesn't seem to be doing well right now, losing by nearly 400,000 votes. A couple others that we're paying attention to, Proposition 121, that's going to be that income tax reduction. It's going to drop from 4.55% to 4.4%. That one popular among the voters, not really a surprise. I'll show you the map there quickly so you can get an idea of just how popular it is. There's just one tiny little area right here in Boulder that's so far not saying yes to that. Um, and it's, you know, pretty close. But um, that one, you know, is um, going to be popular among, among people, particularly right now, because it's going to save them money. And the psychedelic substance is one. That one's really close at the moment. I'm going to move this up just a tiny bit so you can see it a little bit better. It's about a percentage point difference. Um, I'll show you the map there as well. That one would bring psychedelic healing centers into the state, but you could see obviously the metro area seems to be supporting it more, along with places like Aspen. Um, so we're going to keep a close eye on this map, but you know, a lot of the state, particularly here on this side of the state, is saying no so far. Uh, so too close to call at this point, but definitely an interesting one. And, and Megan, let's take into more of those initiatives because a lot of them are getting a lot of interest, obviously, on the liquor side and the mushroom side, but other ones we're also taking a look at. Let's start with Amendment D to create a new judicial district. That one passing and, and moving through by a pretty significant margin. Amendment E, extend the homestead exemption, a significant number. They're 88 to 12 with 63% uh, voting. And then Amendment F, the charitable gaming conduct, we talked about that a little bit, 6139 going down, going further down on that list. Proposition 126, we talked about alcohol delivery and that you said is too close to call. A difference right now of about 91,000 votes. Proposition FF, funding the school meal program, 55-45 in favor. That's a difference right now of 170,000 votes with 65% of the, of the votes in. And then Proposition GG, requiring a tax impact table for you so you can understand when you're voting that voters clearly wanting to have a better understanding when they're voting yes or no on increased taxes a 71 to 29 percent number there so the initiatives very interesting to follow on a night when we've been talking about a real democrat dominance at the ballot box you can see how people are voting both in their pocketbook side for liquor and for things like mushrooms a lot still to follow but many of these decided right now and shannon and, and we're also seeing some new uh, some new races called by the ap phil weiser jenna griswold amendment d and amendment e and we'll have more on that coming up we're also watching several critical u.s senate races where just one could impact the future of policy making in Washington. That's right. Several key uh, states, uh, Senate races up toss ups. Uh, Pennsylvania, Georgia still actually just now J.D. Vance was called by the AP will win Ohio. ABC's M. Webb tracking all of it tonight from Washington uh, and the stakes here could not be higher. Exactly. And the anticipation is growing here on Capitol Hill to find out exactly which party will now control the House and Senate. Of course, we also did learn a little bit more about what voters were thinking about as they cast their ballot today. At the very top of voters' minds, according to preliminary exit poll data, inflation is the number one issue for voters at 32 percent. But surprisingly, that preliminary data also finding the issue of abortion a second, uh, close second in importance to voters at 27 percent. Now, okay, to the projections, as you mentioned, in Ohio, ABC News is projecting Republican J.D. Vance to win over Democrat Tim Ryan. In Colorado, ABC News projecting Democratic Senator Michael Bennett to win. In Florida, ABC News is projecting Governor Ron DeSantis, a rumored 2024 presidential candidate, to defeat former Republican Governor Charlie Crist. Also in Florida, Democratic House candidate Maxwell Frost, a 25-year-old progressive, is projected to win 
his race, making him the first ever Gen Z member of Congress. Now, Georgia and Pennsylvania were watching also very closely. That's also too tight to say anything at this point. But of course, we will continue to watch very closely. So, Em, election officials say because of early voting, because of mail-in voting, it, it could be days before everything's counted. Uh, that could be some fertile ground for some uh, rabble-rousing from, uh, from some people. Right, exactly. So the idea here is that many states across the nation this year particularly actually expanded early and mail-in ballots. So election experts say that to be patient and because of this influx of mail-in and early ballots that as we continue to gather the results we could see one party or the other uh, leading at first but as we continue to get the results through tonight maybe tomorrow maybe even the days to come that could shift from red to blue or vice versa so election experts say be patient and want to remind everyone that just because we may see the shift does not mean that there is a problem in the process but rather that the workers are doing their jobs thoroughly. Well, Em, the electric doesn't do patients well, but we will all try. Thanks for your work tonight. We sure appreciate it. ABC's Em Wen joining us live tonight. Thank you for watching this Denver 7 News election night update. I'm Andrew Hill. And I'm Shannon Ogden. All right, some races have been called. Uh, let's take a look at the very latest. Uh, what has been called, we've already called the governor's race, already called the Senate race, Bennett and Polis. Both Democrats will hold on to their seat. ABC News, uh, or, or rather the AP. All right, you want to go through these first? All right, as I said, Governor Polis wins re-election uh, handily over Heidi Ganahl. And let's move on to the next page, the U.S. Senate race. As you all know, Michael Bennett up for re-election and uh, handily won 56 to 42 percent. All right, this is the one that still has not been called yet. This is uh, the new district north of Denver. Uh, it is still very close, but at this moment, uh, the Democratic Dara Caraveo has a lead over uh, Republican Barbara Kirkmar. So we're all very closely watching this race. And in the U.S. House District 7, this race has just been called. This is, uh, this is uh, at Perlmutter's seat, and Brittany Pedersen handily beat Eric Codlin 58% to 40% of the vote. All right, let's go to our analyst tonight, uh, investigative reporter most nights tonight. He's our political analyst, Tony Kovaleski. in the studio. Tony? You know... And Shannon, I've been talking via text to some Republican insiders. One called it an absolute bloodbath in the state. We've talked about numbers. Governor Polis winning by significant, almost 20%. And you look at what it was four years ago, and you can see in that race he won by about 9, 10%. Significant gains on that level. On the Senate race, you look at what happened in 2022. Right now with Michael Bennett, about a 14% lead. You can see that on the board. Six years ago, his numbers were not that strong. So you're seeing any chance of a gain by Republicans being totally wiped out by Democrats. That's the headline. That's the story here tonight, that it's been a blue wave in Colorado. No sign of any red wave. And Shannon? All right, Tony, thank you for that. All right, let's go to some of the ballot questions now. Uh, this is uh, allowing alcohol delivery by a third party. Uh, right now, the, uh, the no's have it. Uh, that one's not been called yet, I believe. We've got a long list of uh, propositions and amendments tonight. Okay, Prop 125 allows grocery and convenience stores currently licensed to sell beer to also be able to sell wine and look at this one this is this is crazy these latest numbers showing that at 50 50 right now very close one of the most contentious uh, prop 122 uh, this would be the biggest change to colorado's drug law since well since recreational pot was legalized this would uh, decriminalize the use of psychedelic mushrooms and such and right now it is barely ahead but that one's not over uh yet tonight 
Now this one, FF, Prop FF, which would provide pre free school meals for all Colorado Public School students, regardless of income. This one, 55%, um, yes, to 45%. This, this is uh, asking uh, Colorado voters to raise their taxes, those making over $300,000 a year. So 55 to 45% right now, voters saying yes. All right, so we're still waiting for a House race eight. We are still waiting for the third, uh, Lauren Boebert's race against Adam Frisch out on the West Slope. And we still, and that, that wine issue in the grocery store is very close. Uh, in fact, the, um, the, the Colorado political climate forecast had that one running away as a yes. So uh, that one is, uh, is a surprise there We tonight. also know Amendment D has passed, Amendment E has passed. We know that Phil Weiser has won, as has Jenna Griswold. So those are all the races and propositions that have been called tonight. That's right. All right. That's all we have for right now. But switch over to Local 3 for reaction and analysis to all that we have just said. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. All right, big night tonight on Election Day. Coloradans making their voices heard, and, and really the stakes are so very high tonight. Yeah. And very loud these voices are tonight. Voters getting the final word on reshaping the political landscape here in Colorado and on Capitol Hill. So let's start with some of these races that are too close to call, specifically the 3rd Congressional District. Look at this right now. Adam Frisch with 52% to Lauren Boebert's 48%. This race, again, still waiting on a lot of uh, numbers to come in, a lot of votes to come in. So we will be watching this one. It's just too close. All right, early in this evening, Governor Jared Polis was declared the winner over his challenger, Republican Heidi Ganahl. He won uh, this running away, so that uh, not even close for the governor's office. There. Also early on, AP News confirming incumbent Democratic U.S. Senator Michael Bennett the winner against political newcomer and contractor Joe O'Day. And this was a much needed win for Democrats in the U.S. Senate as they uh, Talk about the control of Congress. All right, to the kind of the, the big race here in Colorado tonight. This is our new district, District 8, Democratic Yudira Caraveo, currently leading uh, Republican Barbara Kirkmeyer by uh, two points right now, but this one is not over yet. This one may go very late uh, into today, maybe even tomorrow. So we have live election team coverage for you tonight. Denver 7 political reporter Megan Lopez breaking down the key races and issues that I know you all want to know about. Colette Bordelon at the GOP watch party where Republicans still optimistic about some of the issues tonight that uh, voters are facing. Also, uh, Denver 7's Jennifer Kovaleski live with the Dems tonight um, and at the Art Hotel, just not far from the station here. And uh, it's been a celebratory night for the Blues. Shannon, Shannon and I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you because as you can see behind me, Attorney General Phil Weiser is here to give his acceptance speech. So let's take a moment and, and, and listen in. Thank you, Colorado. I stand before you filled with gratitude. Yes. Appreciation for all of you who've invested so much into helping us 
make this journey a reality. From the bottom of my heart to all of you, I deeply appreciate you. There are so many people I want to thank, but let me limit it to my family, starting with my wife, Heidi. My son, Sammy. And my parents, Dave and Esther Weiser, where are they? Who are somewhere here. Aviva. And my daughter, Aviva, who amazingly, she's on the East Coast, but we beat her bedtime. My family story, as you know, is one of hope and optimism. My mom was born in a Nazi concentration camp on April 13, 1945. And one week later, she was liberated by the U.S. Army. My family came to the United States of America because they believed in this nation committed to freedom and opportunity for all. And in my family, we are one generation from surviving the Holocaust to standing before you as Colorado's Attorney General. That's America. I often think about my grandmother's resilience during these challenging times. I would ask my grandmother, Bubby, which is what I called her, how did you believe you would have a better future? And she would say to me, it's easier to believe. She refused to give up hope. And tonight in Colorado, we hold on to hope. <laughs> Colorado, as we know well, is truly a special state. I spoke recently to John Kellner and I thanked him for his commitment to the rule of law and democracy and the will of the people. We in Colorado should not take for granted that we had two candidates for attorney general who accepted the results of the 2020 presidential election. We should not take for granted that we had two candidates who showed up to 13 debates and forums across our whole state. We know that our democracy is facing great strains. And in Colorado, we can and we must be a beacon for our nation. Just last week, we lost a friend of mine, a friend of many of ours, Minority Leader Hugh McCain. We will honor Hugh in a couple days, and it's worth remembering how he represented what is best about Colorado, a commitment to problem solving, a kind spirit, and someone who built authentic relationships. As I continue to lead, I will hold on to Hugh's memory as a blessing. I am grateful that my Republican predecessor, Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman, supported me in this journey. I am grateful that sitting Republican State Senator Don Corum endorsed me for re-election. And I'm grateful that former Republican House Speaker Russ George is on our team. Let's recognize how special this is. In Colorado, we gather in friendship. We work hard to build relationships on trust, and we make sure that every single voter in Colorado knows that they count and they matter to us. When Ken Salazar first talked to me... All right, that is the Democratic Attorney General Phil Weiser giving his... Uh, speech tonight his victory speech he uh he won easily so i believe is that is that all the statewide races now have treasurer treasurer i 
don't know Dave Young. It has been called. Okay, so that is all uh, incumbent Democratic statewide races have all been uh, reclaimed by uh, their previous uh, winners. And I and, think you uh, could call it a blue wave in Colorado wave, tonight. Uh, let's go to Denver 7's Colette Bordelon, who's been with Republicans all evening. They've been had been calling for a red wave for months. Um, we know that Heidi Ganahl, Joe Day conceded. Uh, it's got to be a rough night there tonight, Colette. Lots of concession speeches here at the Colorado Republican Party right now. We've already heard from District Attorney of the 18th Judicial District, John Kellner. He was the challenger for that AG position that Phil Weiser has now won, so we've heard from him. We heard from Lang Sias, the Republican contender for state treasurer, conceding to Dave Young. We also heard from Pam Anderson. She was racing for Secretary of State, trying to uproot Jenna Griswold's current position there as Secretary of State. She did concede tonight, and here's what she had to say. While we came up short tonight, I believe that we sent a strong message that we should be operating in a nonpartisan way to build voter confidence for all voters in Colorado and across this nation. So she was one of those concession speeches. We also heard from Joe O'Day conceding to Senator Michael Bennett. He is still here tonight. But the room has dramatically cleared out behind me right now. It was packed when he gave that speech, when Pam Anderson spoke, when John Kellner spoke, and when Lang Sias spoke. Those are the only people we have heard from so far tonight right here at the party location. Of course, we're hanging out to see if anyone else speaks. All right, not a lot of party in the grand old party tonight. Thank you very much. Our election team coverage continues. Megan Lopez, Tony Kobleski in the studio, breaking down uh, the big races and issues tonight. Megan? Yeah, I want to start by looking at some of the key House races. Um, the Democrats were expected because they have such a large majority in the Colorado State House at this point uh, to hold on to that majority. But Republicans were really hoping to at least gain some seats so that they could have a little bit more political sway. Uh, so here's a couple of the races that I'm paying attention to. Uh, this one is a little bit of a surprise for me so far. It's District 25. You've got Representative Colin Larson running against Senator Tammy Story. Colin Larson, from what I've been hearing from my Republican contacts uh, was supposed to be and was potentially going to be uh, the next Republican minority leader for the House after Hugh McKean passed away. You heard Attorney General Phil Weiser talking about Hugh McKean's passing. He was a very big voice in the Colorado State House, and um, so it leaves a big hole to be filled. This one, again, you know, close, but we want to see how it's going to play out. It's only uh, a, a difference of a couple thousand votes at this point. Speaking of Hugh McKean, he was running unopposed. What's going to happen with his seat because he has passed away is a Republican Vacancy Committee is going to fill that. Um, also wanted to talk just a little bit about... Uh, um, this one had District 12. Uh, you've got Tracy Burnett winning pretty handily. She's facing some felony charges right now because of allegations that she doesn't live in the district that she's representing with some of that redistricting that happened. If she wins and is convicted of those felonies or found to not be living in the district, a Democratic vacancy committee would also fill that one, guys. So keeping an eye on all those. All right, thank you. Megan, very much. We'll check out uh, back in with you in a little bit. Over to Tony now. Uh, county by county breakdown. So uh, what do we know here as the evening grows later, Tony? Well, we're watching closely those two House races that we're waiting on and watching. Specifically, let's talk about District 3. This one is getting closer. It was about a 10,000 vote difference a while back. Um, now, now that number is, is cut down to about 7,800 as Lauren Boebert, the late Republican votes coming in. That's getting tighter. And let me give you some historical perspective here because I think it's significant. If you go back to 2020 in this race and, and you look at what happened here, Boebert winning by 26,000 votes, but she got a total of 220,000 votes to win. We go back now to tonight, and you can see her contenders at 127,000 votes. So he's moving closer and closer. That race, a surprise at this point. And then that eighth congressional race, also getting a little closer now, just 4,200 votes between Barbara Kirkmeyer and Yadira Caraveo. That race, as we've talked all night, probably going to go after 11 o'clock, maybe even after midnight tonight. But it is tighter now. We continue to watch that. We talked about that non 
red wave that's happened in Colorado. These two races will determine it a lot. We will continue to watch those. I'll send it back to you guys now. All right. Thank you, Tony. Tony, thank you very much. We bring our strategy back in. Uh, Laura Carno for the Republicans tonight, Steve Welcher for the Dems. And Laura, let's start with some of the, the ballot initiatives. Um, surprised that the, the booze ones aren't, uh, aren't doing better. Yeah, you know, so we, we have a governor who has called himself a libertarian. I, I don't agree with that moniker for him, um, but he's been calling himself a libertarian. This is the land of the free. What? is more free than more booze in more places. <laughs> and I just thought that those would uh, would really be passing by by large margins, making it more free in the grocery stores to have, have access to more product, um, more free for the small uh, mom and pops to, to be able to have more, uh, more stores and then more freedom for consumers to get more delivery. And uh, so I'm, I'm actually kind of stunned by that. The other thing that's interesting to me is that we said by a large margin, um, Independence Institute's uh, 121, the reduction of, of the income tax, we're saying by a large margin, yeah, reduce my income tax. But then we're saying, but the people over 300,000, let's raise their taxes um, to provide um, free school lunches. lunches. Mm -hmm. By the way, to, to a lot of people that don't need, a lot of families that don't need this to be taxpayer funded. So it's a, a little um, Jekyll and Hyde on the on the part of the mm. voters on some of these ballot initiatives. So just kind of tracking some of these to see what's in the mind of the voters. What does that one ballot look like if if we had a voter that that voted um, voted yeah. the, the prevailing the, the, way? The real irony for me is that we may have hallucinogenic mushrooms, but yet not more wine, right? I mean, how's that work? Right. But not, not mushrooms hey, in stores. So yeah, that's, that's very right. We will see how that one works. I know you've been watching the state legislature as well tonight. What are you seeing in those Well, numbers? it was going to be very close. The battle was going to be in the state Senate, and that appears to be over now. I mean, there's still some votes to be counted, but there are some seats that Democrats were really sweating going into tonight, and they look to be very solid. Uh, Tony Exum in Colorado Springs, Mullock up in nor the Northern Burbs, uh, Lisa Cutter in South Jeffco and, and uh, Englewood area. Uh, those, those are really big seats, and I, those, those are now all going to go blue, and the blue wave is in place for the state Senate as well. All right, so... Uh Big picture. What do you? Uh, what's your big takeaway from uh, from the races here in Colorado tonight? Yeah, completely surprised. Um, w where were uh, going into this? The polls were doing nothing but tightening, and the momentum was doing nothing but going in the Republicans' favor. So I think the analysis at the end of this, when all of the votes are in, is who voted and who stayed home, and what some of these maybe exit polls um, looked like. So, you know, did did Joe O'Day's moderation on, or his moderate stance on social issues, did that keep more pro-life Republicans home than it gained uh, unaffiliated votes who were, who were happier with that stance? And with 15 seconds, Steve? No, I, I think Joe O'Day ran a great campaign, I really do. But when Heidi Ganahl is the top of your ticket as governor, and her main issues, you know, kitty litter boxes in schools. It's just a really tough hill to climb. All right, Steve, Laura, thank you both very thank much. You both. And we will be right back after this.
The true poll of which political party voters want to control Congress could be learned as early as tonight, but more likely in a few days. Yeah, our election team coverage continues now. Megan Lopez breaking down those very closely watched races. Megan? And we're going to take a look at the state uh, Senate in, in order to kind of give you an, a better idea, guys. So 35 seats, 17 of them up for grabs. Democrats right now have the control. Uh, there's seven really that we're watching. So I want to start in Senate District 3. Right now, Democrats are holding the lead in all seven of those close races. This one has Nick Heinrichson running against Stephen Varela. Uh, Varela. Uh, right now, Heinrichsen is winning. Let's go ahead and move on over to Senate District 8. Representative Dylan Roberts right now is holding the lead over Matt Solomon. And next one is Senate District 11. Democratic uh, Representative Tony Exum is winning right now against Senator Dennis Heisey. Next one is Senate District 15. That one has Janice Marchman right now. She's a political newcomer who bills herself as, as just a plain mom, um, winning right now against Representative Rob Woodward. Moving over to Senate District 20. This one got really ugly. You might have seen some of those campaign ads. Representative Lisa Cutter right now winning against newcomer Tim Walsh. And then you have in District 24, Kyle Mullica at this point uh, beating uh, Courtney Potter. And then finally, in District 27, uh, Democratic Representative uh, Tom Sullivan winning right now against Tom Kim. All of these, you know, are going to help kind of determine the balance of power in the state Senate and really whether the Democrats hold on to the trifecta. Right now it's looking really good for Democrats in order to be able to hold on to the state Senate. Something else we're going to be paying attention to in these races and in kind of in the days after these races is really what becomes of the leadership there because the Republican leadership, no matter who wins or loses, is going to need new leaders because uh, Senator Chris Holbert and Senator John Cook both turned out and so uh, they're done. So that, uh, we're going to have to see how the state Senate Republican Party goes. But right now, let's go to break and we'll come back with some more results. All right, closing out the 9 o'clock hour here, back to Laura Carno and Steve Welchert. Um, boy, the Dems ran away with the, uh, the statewide offices tonight. 
The statewide constitutional offices are really surprised to me. Uh, most Democrats thought we were going to lose one or two of those somewhere. Uh, last time Democrats won all those seats, they gave them back in the next election four years later. So to hold every one of those this time was a big surprise. Uh, Pam Anderson was a strong candidate, in my view, for the Republicans for Secretary of State. Um, but they all kept their numbers in the mid to high 50s. And uh, I got to give Jared Polis a little bit of credit for having some coattails perhaps this time. It, because with Colorado's independent streak are so many unaffiliated voters, you, you did expect, I think a lot of people expected that there would be splitting tickets tonight. That did not happen. Yeah, and we've, we've done that before with a, a Democrat governor and Republicans in, the, in those other uh, Rate in in those other seats, and so that is a big shock uh, that the that the Jared Polis uh, coattails were were big enough because that. I'll tell you what, as a Republican, those were great candidates across the board. I know all of them. They are all my friends. They are great candidates, and they didn't have the negatives that came along with some of the other candidates that we saw in the in the primaries. Yeah, for, for example, Lang Sias, the treasurer candidate, had run for Congress in, in Congressional right, Senate right, against Ed right. Perlmutter. He lost the primary. We were really worried that if he won that primary, right. he'd be a very tough opponent. Now he's running for treasurer, loses again, and I think he's out of politics now. But, but uh, again, strong candidate, Pam Anderson, a strong candidate. I wasn't excited about Kellner for AG, but but uh, I think it was, it was a different race all around. Was this already decided, do you think? Uh, was this uh, set in stone, the, the governor's race, before we even got going? Or or did Heidi Ganahl win or lose this thing? Well, you know, we've talked about how hard it is to unseat an incumbent governor. It's we, Colorado hasn't done that for 60 years. So you have that uphill um, to start with, and then you have $28 million. So, so those are two really tough things to, um, uh, to overcome, and there was just not enough there to overcome it. Can we talk about the 8th Congressional District race right now, which I think, I mean, no one knows what to expect of this race, but this is closer, I think, than anybody yeah. expected. Uh, I expected to stay close and perhaps for a long, long time. Uh, I looked at the underlying races for the State Board of Education and for the CU Regent race. There are also 50-50 races, and so that pretends for this race to also be close going out of the wire. I'll just remind voters at home that uh, in 2002, when we had a brand new CD7, wasn't decided until December. Both Bob Beaupre, oh, who right. won the race, and Mike Feely were both seated by their right. caucuses in Congress and were allowed to vote in their caucus in Congress. Wasn't decided until December. So get comfortable, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your thoughts on the 8th here as we're wrapping up this hour? Yeah, I mean, the redistricting commission said this is a competitive seat. It is a competitive seat, apparently. Uh, I, the polls were showing uh, Barb Kirkmeyer pulling ahead, and I still have that expectation. And maybe just being hopeful that um, we have some wins tonight that so we're not seeing. It's going to be a long night. Adams County is notoriously slow for counting votes, <laughs> and they're going to be slow again tonight, I think. Yep. So. Well, and here are the latest numbers right now. Yadira Caraveo with 49% to Barbara Kirkmeyer's 46%. So, yeah, that's close. All right. All right. That's going to do it for us on Local 3. All right, switch over to ABC for Denver 7 News at 10.
wave through Colorado. It is definitely blue. Definitely blue. A night for the Democrats indeed, especially the incumbents. Four more years for Governor Polis, six more years for Senator Michael Bennett. So glad you're with us on this election night. I'm Shannon Ogden. I'm Ann Trujillo. So let's get right to those top results so you can see how your voice, your vote came in. All right, we'll recap with Governor Polis. An early winner, this one was called, a 58-40% to his challenger, Heidi Ganahl. Senator Michael Bennett beat political newcomer and contractor Joe O'Day by a similar margin. All right, let's go to the, the tricky one here. Colorado's brand new congressional district, District 8, just north of Denver, up Greeley Way. Uh, it is as tight as we thought it was going to be. So right now, as we're coming on the air, the Democrat Yadira Caraveo, state rep, Pediatrician up 49 to 47% over State Senator Barbara Kirkmeyer. Another interesting storyline developing tonight in Colorado's Congressional District 3, where incumbent Congresswoman Lauren Boebert facing a tight challenge from Democrat Adam Frisch. Look at these numbers right now. Adam Frisch still with a lead wow. at 52 to Boebert's 48%. And we have reaction, in-depth analysis for you. Denver 7 political reporter Megan Lopez is breaking down the key races and issues you decided tonight. Cleb Bordelon, she is at the Republican watch party tonight. All right, let's begin with Denver 7's Jennifer Kovaleski live with the Dems at the headquarters. Much different mood there. A lot of races called very early there, Jen. Shannon and the races were called early and many of those candidates won by big numbers. There is no question that it has been a big night for Colorado Democrats. We've heard four accepted speeches so far tonight. The latest to take the stage, Attorney General Phil Weiser. Governor Jared Polis was first up after that race was called really early. His message to Colorado was one of unity. We sat down and did a one-on-one -on -one interview with Polis and U.S. Senator Michael Bennett, who also won big tonight. What didn't you get done that you want to focus on these next four years? There's a lot ahead. We've got free full-day preschool and kindergarten for every family, saving families thousands of dollars. We're going to implement preschool starts next year. We've got to tackle housing and public safety. So you're going to see a lot of our focus on making Colorado one of the 10 safest states over the next five years. That's our goal. And in making sure that people have real opportunities to buy and to rent that people can afford so people can thrive in our state and businesses can thrive. How would you describe the night for Colorado Democrats? It's been a great, well, I think it's a great night for Colorado. That That's what I would say. And a great night for the country. You, never you know, the candidates that ran, I'm so proud it to have run with you. the people that I ran with, from Jared Polis to the rest of these candidates. These are serious are people. They're not, they're not, home. they're not soundbite people. They're, they're, they're less, less politicians than they are public servants. And well, we that's what I think Colorado wants, and that's now what Colorado's going to have. Bennett is the first Colorado senator to win a third term in a very long time. We're talking since the 1960s. Now, we asked Bennett if he's concerned about the balance of power shifting in Washington. He told us that he's never had a problem working with Republicans. But he did make clear during his acceptance speech about the importance of electing a pro-choice majority in both the Senate and the House. Now, as you mentioned, there are still some key races that we are waiting for results on, including the 7th and the 8th Congressional District. And that is what everyone here is still waiting for. But there is still a lot of excitement, and they seem to think that this is going to go in their favor. But as we know, that 8th Congressional District is still very close tonight. For now, we are live at the Dem Watch Party. I'm Jennifer Kribaleski. All right, Jen, thank you. Denver 7's Colette Bordelon at a much more muted Republican watch party tonight. We know that Heidi Ganahl left without giving a speech tonight and you caught up with her elsewhere. So uh, give us the, the key takeaway from her for tonight, Colette. Yeah, well, she actually went and gave a concession speech of sorts at a saloon in Sedalia, just around 20 minutes from here. She left before speaking to the crowd that was here right now. Most of them have cleared out. Joe O'Day did give a concession speech here tonight. But what Heidi told our photojournalist who was down there is that this was, of course, something she did not expect. She was tearful, and she did say, what do you do after something like this? You take a nap. We need our party to come together and unite and focus on winning the state back because what's happening right now is terrible and I'm just I'm just devastated that the people of Colorado chose another four years of this. On the ground it's been amazing. We have such wonderful supporters and such great momentum all over the state. So many moms and parents and kids that are so excited about this campaign. I'm mostly just sad for them and they've been so wonderful. 
that I feel, uh, yeah, I just feel sad for them. Obviously, a lot of emotion from Ganahl tonight. Now, other Republicans we've heard from here at the official watch party included District Attorney for the 18th Judicial District, John Kellner, who conceded to AG Phil Weiser. We also heard from Pam Anderson, who was running for Secretary of State. She conceded to Jenna Griswold. Now, we still have not heard from Barbara Kirkmeyer. I know Jen was talking about that Congressional District 8, how tight of a race that still is tonight. Still waiting to hear what will become of that that race and if we hear from Kirk Meyer. All right, Colette Bordelon, thank you very much. Our team coverage continues for you tonight. Megan Lopez and Tony Kovaleski are breaking down the key races. Megan, since we're talking about the eight, let's start with the eighth. It is tight, tight, tight. That's right. It is very tight. I mean, you're looking at uh, 4,000 votes or so difference, about three percentage points. Uh, and, and what we were kind of expecting was for Yadira Caraveo to have a lead in the beginning because we did see uh, the Democratic ballots returned at a higher level um, than the Republican ballots and then more Republican ballots kind of coming in day of. Um, and she's holding on to that lead right now. But 538 projections had strongly favored uh, Barb Kirkmeyer in order to win it. Yadira Caraveo is a uh, pediatrician. She is a state lawmaker who is really focused on health care issues. Um, Barb Kirkmeyer, meanwhile, is a first time state senator um, who focused on, you know, oil and gas operations, for instance, and, and um, trying to lower uh, taxes and fees. So I did want to take a look quickly at uh, the map here that we've got uh, for what's happening so far. There's not really a lot of surprises. Um, so what you're seeing, this county is made up of three different parts, or this district rather, is made up of three different counties. You've got Weld, Larimer, and then Adams County. Adams County right now is breaking for Caraveo. That's where she's picking up a lot of her votes at this point. You can see she's beating Kirkmeyer in this county 55% to 40%. Where Kirkmeyer is doing really well is in Weld County. Uh, she's handily beating uh, Yadira Caraveo 57% to 39%. Larimer County is a much closer area to be watching. So this district is a, a unique one because it's the first time that we're going to have a representative from this district. It has very low voter turnout historically, and it is primarily Latino and non-white voters. So a very important district, a very tight race, and one that right now is just too close to call. All right. Megan Lopez, thank you very much, Megan. Back with you in just a bit. Now to Tony Kovaleski with uh, the results so far, county uh, by county. And Tony, um, we're going to go to bed tonight with uh, Colorado a little bit bluer than I think we, uh, a lot of people expected. Uh, a little bit bluer. We've seen across the country the red wave. Red wave in Colorado, you could probably fit inside this water glass right here because that's about all that happened. There wasn't even that much. And I'm going to take you inside the numbers. You're going to see historically how Democrats not only won by big numbers, but also improved on where they were four or six years ago. Let's start with the governor's race and Governor Polis. This was in 2022. You can see he's now got a more than 20 percent lead in that race. If we go back just four years to see how those numbers worked and in that governor's race statewide, you will see numbers that are significant and and this is why let me back you up my computer's giving me a little difficulty here we'll go to that governor race good 58 percent 49 four years ago governor polis winning only by nine percent so we increase those numbers the ag race let's look at that 2022 phil weiser 54 to 43 you go back four years only 50 to 46 over george brockler you look at the senate race historically again We'll start 2022 and Michael Bennett, 56% to 41. You go back six years in that race, Bennett winning only 50 to 44. So historically, Democrats not only won by big numbers, they increased on where they were four years ago. Any discussion of a red wave in Colorado is a non-discussion, a non-issue, a big, big night for Democrats. That only race, the only race they're probably looking at for a victory is that 8th Congressional District, and that probably will go past midnight and maybe even into tomorrow. So I think it's a time for Colorado's Republican Party to look in the mirror and say, what does the future look like? Because right now, a strong message coming from Democrats in the state. All right, Tony Kobaleski, thanks for your, uh, your help there, Tony. Uh, our guest tonight, expert analyst, Republican strategist, uh, Laura Carno to my left and to the right, oddly, uh, <laughs> Democrat, <laughs> Steve Welch. 
Well, and Tony mentioned the 8th Congressional District, but it's really the third also that we should be talking about as well because uh, we know that uh, Adam Frisch has, has taken the lead over Lauren Boebert, but you're saying that there are still a lot of districts that are notorious for reporting late, correct? Right. Pueblo, the county of Pueblo has notoriously been a very late reporter um, where you don't know all of the votes for days. Um, we're also um, hearing from Magellan Strategies that there's another 100 to 150,000 votes out there yet to be counted. Mm -hmm. um, so if those are same day votes, those are probably going to lean Republic, strongly Republican. Yeah, this race is tighter than most people expected yep. at this point. I would say that the fact that we're even talking about District 3, as much money as she raised, the profile she has, really speaks to where Coloradans are at. That the crazy is out of fashion right now. And, and that we said that kind of statewide, we're saying it in CD3 as well. She may yet win this thing because, there, because Laura's right. There are a lot of votes in Mesa County, which is Grand Junction, and Public County that haven't been counted yet. But, but boy, the fact that this is even close is really saying something. And I know a very popular question to a lot of the Republican candidates nationwide, including here in Colorado, is will you accept the results of, of the race, whatever? I, I don't know that I heard that from Boebert. Do you know the answer to that? I don't know that I heard that question okay. asked. Right. Yeah. Very good. Uh, let's talk about the eighth for a moment because that is neck and neck and, and people were not expecting it to be that close. And th What's and that, your assessment that, that, that would one? be where the question will actually matter is at CD8, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I'll remind folks that back in 2002 when CD7 was brand new, it took until December to decide this race. And so when you look at the, at the State Board of Education race and the Regent race, also in CD8, they're also 50-50. So this could be a long, long process uh, to, to work itself out. All right. Steve, Laura, thank, thank you, you both, both very much. We really so appreciate much. it. All right, before we head to our break, a look at some of the other races. Uh, House District 3, as we said, not been called out on the West Slope. Adam Frisch, though, right now with the results we have, leading incumbent Lauren Bober. And again, the newly created 8th District, Adira Caraveo, beating Barbara Kirkmeyer right now. All right. Congressional District 7, Brittany Pedersen has been declared the winner. This is Pearl Mutter's old seat. Uh, she beats Republican Eric Odlin by a pretty wide margin tonight. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to your voice, your vote coverage tonight. In addition to the candidates vying for office this midterm election, several statewide issues are on the ballot. That's right. Let's start with Proposition FF. Now, this would provide free school meals for all Colorado public school students, regardless of their income. It's paid for, would be paid for, by uh, taxing, uh, reducing the tax deductions, technically, for those making over 
$300,000 a year. And right now, uh, it's yes for free school meals. Of the three alcohol-related issues on the ballot, Prop 126 would allow for third-party delivery of alcoholic beverages, making permanent a current COVID-related policy that allows restaurants and bars to offer alcohol takeout and delivery. That one's going down. All right, Prop 125 allows grocery stores and convenience stores, the ones that currently sell beer, to also sell wine. And right now, that is tight, tight, tight. <laughs> Got and a couple of tight races tonight. Prop 124 gradually increasing the number of retail liquor licenses a business can hold until limits are completely phased out. Uh, that one is going down as well right now. All right. What do you say we move on to mushrooms? One of the most contentious <laughs> initiatives. Prop 122 uh, would make the biggest change to Colorado drug laws since pot was legalized. So this would decriminalize the use of a lot of psychedelics, including psychedelic mushrooms for those over 21. And right now that is on the way to passing, but there's still a good chunk of votes to be counted on that. All right, back here in the studio, joined by Denver 7 political reporter, Megan Lopez. So let's focus on the, uh, the local balance of power in the state house. And for the local balance of power, what you're really going to be watching is the state Senate. The state House, the Democrats have a pretty commanding lead. It's uh, 41 seats to about 24 seats at this uh, at um, currently. Um, if they do go ahead and win, you know, even a, a fraction of those seats, they'll be able to hold. So Republicans aren't really targeting that in particular in order to win. They're really targeting the state Senate. So far, what we're seeing in the seven races that they were expecting uh, to be close or that they were hoping to flip in some way, uh, we're seeing Democrats kind of take control. So in terms of uh, of the balance of power, 35 seats up in the Senate um, or in, are in the Senate, 17 are up for grabs. Uh, Democrats were favored to win four of those. Republicans were favored to win six. So talking about those seven, I mean, you've got some like um, Senator Nick Heinrichsen in District 3 in Pueblo. Uh, he's doing really well right now. Um, he's holding the seat for Leroy Garcia. You also have uh, the Representative Dylan Roberts in District 8. This is more of the mountain communities. Uh, he's doing really well right now. He's uh, beating Matt Solomon by about uh, 9,000 votes or so, 8,000 votes. Um, the interesting thing about this portion of the district is that uh, Matt Solomon, the Republican, is doing well in Moffitt, Rio Blanco, Garfield, and Jackson, while Dylan Roberts is doing well in Route, Grand, uh, Summit, Eagle, which is where he's from, Clear Creek and Gilpin counties. Uh, this one was one of the ones that Republicans said that they had to win in order to take control of the state Senate. And it just looks like that that state Senate balance of power is going to stay with the Democrats if these numbers hold up and that that red wave that we've been hearing about nationally just isn't even reaching the state house at this point, guys. All right. We know you'll keep watching. Thank you, Megan. Now let's focus on the national balance of power. And while Colorado's races are largely going as in anticipated Tony, the national race for power in Congress, still very much on the line tonight. Well, on the Senate side, and they were talking about 10 competitive races, and either side winning five, they would get power back. Right now, according to the New York Times, both Colorado and New Hampshire have gone Democrat. North Carolina and Ohio have gone Republican. We are waiting on Arizona, Georgia, and Nevada. Those will be the deciding factors on the Senate side. And then when we look at the House balance of power that also with 65 competitive races 49 have to go democrat in order for the democrats to remain in power and in the house and when we look here in colorado and those races and those numbers you've talked about it we've been looking closely at that third district and right now it's about an 8,000 vote difference between adam frisch and lauren bobert that number closer than we expected. But again, we've been saying all along, we expect Republican numbers, and Republican votes, Pueblo and other spots to come in later. So that will decide that. And then eighth judicial, that is an absolute dogfight. It's been between three and 4,000 votes all night long. So those two will have a large part of that balance of power in the House. And Shannon. All right, Tony, thank you very much. And let's dig deeper on the governor's races. Uh, voters in three dozen states, including, of course, here in Colorado, uh, had gubernatorial races. Our Joe St. George reports from Washington. 
There have been some big name governors nationally cruising to re-election tonight in Ohio. Incumbent Republican Governor Mike DeWine has won re-election in Florida. Republican Governor Ron DeSantis has won in Colorado. Incumbent Democratic Governor Jared Polis has won re-election. Remember, these governors face some pretty crucial decisions during the COVID pandemic, they faced a lot of criticism over lockdowns or decisions at times. Thus far tonight, blowback has been minimal, at least when it comes to that issue. However, there still remains close races in states like Wisconsin, Nevada, Michigan, and New York. Incumbent Democratic governors are waiting anxiously for results there. However, Republicans have suffered their first major disappointment of the night in Colorado. That's because incumbent Democratic Senator Michael Bennett has won re-election in that state. Many conservatives nationally had been hoping that a red wave would sweep across the Rocky Mountains, impact a pretty blue state like Colorado. That is not the case this evening. It suggests that if a red wave does occur when this election's all said and done, it may not be as big as some Republicans had hoped. Remember, though, we're simply not going to know the full picture when it comes to the U.S. Senate this evening. Races in states like Pennsylvania are simply too close. We may have a better understanding of where things stand in the House of Representatives, however, if Republicans do take back that chamber, as some have forecasted, it would mean new political debates in this country over everything from IRS funding to the border. It would also be a lot harder for President Biden to get his agenda accomplished. In Washington, I'm Joe St. George. All right, so there are two congressional races here in Colorado that have not been called. This one is the closest right now with Yadira Caraveo still with a narrow lead over Barbara Kirkmeyer. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Your Voice, Your Vote. And what just happened in Colorado tonight? This was, I think, not the night that, that anyone really expected. It, Colorado is definitely a blue state right now. Is that what we can safely say? It, it went blue two years ago. It is now officially royal blue and probably going to stay blue for the foreseeable future, no doubt. Yeah, uh, disappointingly to um, everybody on my side of the aisle, because we thought that this red wave was at least going to be a little bit of a red trickle, a, a smaller wave here, um, but we definitely are living in a blue state. But you are seeing some bright spots. Yeah, the, I, I was looking at digging into the numbers in um, Douglas County, and uh, the sheriff's candidate there, Darren Weekly, a friend of mine, won by 64%. But then looking at the uh, Republican votes for the, the constitutional seats, they were only 53% Republican votes. So it's very interesting when we talk about either ticket splitting or undervoting, um, what happened with those voters? And I think there, um, there are gonna be very interesting case studies. I'd, I'd, I'll be taking a look at the, um, after everything comes in in Douglas County as an example. So let's go to the eighth district, our new one that's not called yet. And, uh, and Steve, we have a, a libertarian here who might be playing spoiler tonight. Absolutely. I mean, the Libertarians at 4% of the vote. When you have two candidates at 50-50, essentially, four points could make the difference uh, dramatically. And Libertarians generally take from Republicans. I think Laura would agree with that yep. analysis. And, and so it's a two-point split right it's now. It's a two-point yeah. split, right. Really tough. And then again, the State Board of Education and the C Regent, also in CD8, are also 50-50 races. And so it could be a long, long time for this seat. And what do you think this says about Colorado that, I mean, is it is it, you know, a, a statement about Trump? Is it a statement about Biden? Is it just that that Colorado said we want to play it safe right now? What, what do you, what do you think this says tonight? Well, this was a Biden plus 13 state two years ago. Now we're a plus 20 state. I mean, you know, for polls to have that kind of number, even Michael Bennett did that. Michael Bennett didn't think he's going to have that kind of number tonight. Right. He won by two touchdowns. Uh, that's a big deal for Michael Bennett, and he's very happy about that. The other one I thought was really incredible was Congressional District 7, open seat, newly drawn. Uh, it lost Rappo County, lost Adams County, just mm -hmm. had Jeffco as the base. Um, Ed Perlmutter is not running for that seat, as we know. Uh, Brittany Pedersen ran up to score for 45,000 votes in Jeffco alone tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an Ed Perlmutter hoorah right there. Yeah, no one thought it would be that close. No. All right, quick final thoughts from, uh, from uh, you, Laura. Yeah, and I just want to say, um, let's not forget all of the people who've moved to Colorado from very blue states. There's been a lot of in-migration um, from a lot of um, states that... They brought their voting habits with them. And yeah, let's not forget good. that. <laughs> and their mushrooms. Yeah, and their mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have, uh, yeah, we've had a lot of big developments here in Colorado tonight. A lot yeah. of races called the third and the eighth. Still, we are watching. All right. So stay with us. Be right back.
All right, as we leave you tonight, there are still some issues undecided tonight, but two major congressional races still undecided tonight. First, the third congressional district, Democrat Adam Frisch leading incumbent Republican Lauren Boebert. And then the new district, District 8, Yadira Caraveo, still leading Republican Barb Kirkmeyer, but too close to call as we end our coverage this evening. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.